We welcome you to Codependence Anonymous, a program of recovery from codependence where each of us may share our experience, strength, and hope in our efforts to find freedom where there has been bondage and peace where there has been turmoil in our relationships with others and ourselves. Most of us have been searching for ways to overcome the dilemmas of the conflicts in our relationships and our childhoods. Many of us were raised in families where addictions existed. Some of us were not. In either case, we have found in each of our lives that codependence is a most deeply rooted compulsive behavior and that it is born out of our sometimes moderately, sometimes extremely dysfunctional families and other systems. We have each experienced in our own ways the painful trauma of the emptiness of our childhood and relationships throughout our lives. We attempted to use others, our mates, friends, and even our children as our sole source of identity, value, and well-being, and as a way of trying to restore within us the emotional losses from our childhoods. Our histories may include other powerful addictions which at times we have used to cope with our codependence. We have all learned to survive life, but in CODA, we are learning to live life. Through applying the 12 steps and principles found in CODA to our da daily life and relationships, both present and past, we can experience a new freedom from our self-defeating lifestyles. It is an individual growth process. Each of us is growing at our own pace and will continue to do so as we remain open to God's will for us on a daily basis. Our sharing is our way of identification and helps us to free the emotional bonds of our past and the compulsive control of our present. No matter how traumatic your past or despairing your present may seem, there is hope for a new day in the program of Codependence Anonymous. No longer do you need to rely on others as a power greater than yourself. May you instead find here a new strength within to be that which God intended, precious and free. Codependence Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women whose common purpose is to develop healthy relationships. The only requirement for membership is a desire for healthy and loving relationships. We gather together to support and share with each other in a journey of self-discovery, learning to love the self. Living the program allows each of us to become increasingly honest with ourselves about our personal histories and our own codependent behaviors. We rely upon the 12 steps and 12 traditions for knowledge and wisdom. These are the principles of our program and guides to developing honest and fulfilling relationships with ourselves and others. In CODA, we each learn to build a bridge to a higher power of our own understanding, and we allow others the same privilege. This renewal process is a gift of healing for us. By actively working the program of Codependence Anonymous, we can each realize a new joy, acceptance, and serenity in our lives. The 12 Steps of Codependence Anonymous. One, we, we admitted we were powerless over others, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. Seven, humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other codependents and to practice these principles in all our affairs. The 12 Traditions of Codependence Anonymous. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon CODA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, 
a loving higher power as expressed to our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern. Three, the only requirement for membership in CODA is a desire for healthy and loving relationships. Four, each group should remain autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or CODA as a whole. Five, each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to other codependents who still suffer. Six, a CODA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the CODA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary spiritual aim. Seven, a CODA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Codependents Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, CODA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. 10, CODA has no opinion on outside issues, hence the CODA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. 11, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. 12. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. The 12 Promises of Codependence Anonymous. 1. I know a new sense of belonging. The feelings of emptiness and loneliness will disappear. 2. I am no longer controlled by my fears. I overcome my fears and act with courage, integrity, and dignity. Three, I know a new freedom. Four, I release myself from worry, guilt, and regret about my past and present. I am aware enough not to repeat it. Five, I know a new love accept and acceptance of myself and others. I feel genuinely lovable, loving, and loved. Six, I learn to see myself as equal to others. My new and renewed relationships are all with equal partners. Seven, I am capable of developing and maintaining healthy and loving relationships. The need to control and manipulate others will disappear as I learn to trust those who are trustworthy. Eight, I learn that it is possible for me to mend, to become more loving, intimate, and supportive. I have the choice of communicating with my family in a way which is safe for me and respectful of them. Nine, I acknowledge that I am a unique and precious creation. 10, I no longer need to rely solely on others to provide my sense of worth. 11, I trust the guidance I receive from my higher power and come to believe in my own capabilities. 12, I gradually experience serenity, strength, and spiritual growth in my daily life. Hi everybody, um, I'm Heidi, I'm codependent. <clears throat> and um, grateful to get to share this uh, important topic um, of recovery, um, especially at a time right now when uh, a lot of us are acting out in obsession. I can only speak for myself, but, uh, but from what I understand, I'm not alone, go figure. Um, that with uh, quarantine and change and um, sort of this worldly, um, you know, event that's going on uh, that we feel so powerless over, that uh, the media pulls us into um, all the newest, latest, and greatest information. What are the latest statistics? What are our leaders doing what are they deciding what are they not deciding you know it's so easy to go into obsession around all of that um, that's going on and uh, to avoid our feelings around it um, and uh, you know we do need to be informed but I have to ask myself a lot like what's healthy a healthy level of being aware being informed doing my research checking things out uh, in order to take better care of myself, set healthy boundaries, make good decisions, uh, be prepared for what's coming down the pike, and then what am I just using to fix? And um, obsession is a powerful addiction for me. 
and um, I've learned how to arrest it. I don't always arrest it, but I've learned how to arrest it. And so that's, um, that's what I'm going to share today um, is what, what I've learned and, um, and what doesn't work. I'm going to share a lot about what doesn't work. Uh, I have a lot of knowledge about that. Um, but, um, you know, what, what I've come to understand about obsession that makes it so critical to address it is that um, is that most all of my defects of character require obsession in order to function so like for instance try having a resentment without obsessing um, or try to build a case against somebody and judge them without obsessing um, or try to future fantasize and uh, or future trip or um, catastrophize or villainize or I mean all that stuff you know all the acting out that happens in my head um, around my codependence to fix feelings requires obsession I have to dig in I have to get into it I have to make stuff up I have to you know think 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 um, and uh, you know what am I doing really with that? You know, am I am I am I taking care with that? Am I being honest with that? Am I staying in reality? Am I talking to God with that, or am I just obsessing? You know, and um, obsession for me it just fixes feelings. You know, uh, fixes feelings of fear. You know, um, it fixes feelings of powerlessness. It fixes feelings of sadness. It fixes feelings of. Um, um, confusion you know feeling lost not knowing what to do um and definitely pain you know i can fix pain for sure with obsession um and you know i've used it my whole life um and in in an earlier recovery like i would know when i was obsessing like we learn about that around here you know we learn that like oh i'm obsessing okay stop obsessing but we don't really give it too much thought you know um and uh yeah 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 okay whatever and you know like yeah i probably shouldn't and nah, 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 nah. but we have no idea just hi everybody um i'm heidi i'm codependent <clears throat> and um grateful to get to share this uh important topic um of recovery um especially at a time right now when uh a lot of us are acting out in obsession i can only speak for myself but uh but from what i understand i'm not alone go figure um that with uh quarantine and change and um sort of this worldly um you know event that's going on um, that we feel so powerless over, that uh, the media pulls us into, um, all the newest, latest, and greatest information, what are the latest statistics, what are our leaders doing, what are they deciding, what are they not deciding, you know, it's so easy to go into obsession around all of that um, that's going on, and uh, to avoid our feelings around it. Um, and uh, you know we do need to be informed, but I have to ask myself a lot, like what's healthy? A healthy level of being aware, being informed, doing my research, checking things out uh, in order to take better care of myself, set healthy boundaries, make good decisions, uh, be prepared for what's coming down the pike, and then what am I just using to fix? And um, Obsession is a powerful addiction for me, and um, I've learned how to arrest it. I don't always arrest it, but I've learned how to arrest it. And so that's, um, that's what I'm gonna share today, um, is what, what I've learned and, um, and what doesn't work. I'm gonna share a lot about what doesn't work. Um, I have a lot of knowledge about that. Um, but, um, you know what what i've come to understand about obsession that makes it so critical to address it is that um is that 
most all of my defects of character require obsession in order to function. So like, for instance, try having a resentment without obsessing. Um, or try to build a case against somebody and judge them without obsessing. Um, or try to future fantasize and, uh, or future trip or um, catastrophize or villainize or, I mean, all that stuff, you know, all the acting out that happens in my head um, around my codependence to fix feelings requires obsession. I have to dig in. I have to get into it. I have to make stuff up. I have to, you know, think, 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 think. Um, and, uh, you know, what am I doing really with that? You know, am I, am, I, am I taking care with that? Am I being honest with that? Am I staying in reality? Am I talking to God with that? Or am I just obsessing, you know? And um, obsession, for me, it just fixes feelings, you know? Uh, fixes feelings of fear, you know? Um, it fixes feelings of powerlessness. It fixes feelings of sadness. It fixes feelings of... Um, um, confusion, you know, feeling lost, not knowing what to do, um, and definitely pain, you know, I can fix pain for sure with obsession. Um, and, you know, I've used it my whole life. Um, and in, in an earlier recovery, like I would know when I was obsessing, like we learn about that around here, you know, we learn that like, oh, I'm obsessing, okay, stop obsessing, but we don't really give it too much thought, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, 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 okay, whatever. And you know, like, yeah, I probably shouldn't. And, 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 and uh, But we have no idea just how much uh, damage that we're doing. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that here, that, that this truly in codependence recovery um, or any kind of addiction recovery is not a subject that we can continue to ignore because obsession will always bring us back to our knees. It will always bring us back to uh, painful feelings of self-abandonment, not taking care of ourselves, not truly caring about the issue that we're medicating with obsession. Um, it doesn't help us grow ourselves up. It doesn't help us come to healthier conclusions. Uh, it doesn't help us connect with our higher power or our higher power's will for us. Um, and, um, and it just usually just keeps us kind of spun out. So, uh, Linda, go ahead and flip to the first slide, and we'll talk about what is obsession. So, obsession is a compulsive addictive thinking pattern and a form of fantasy addiction that's triggered to mitigate the buried toxic shame that drives codependence. That's sort of my definition. Um, and the dictionary's definition is um, preoccupation and idea or feeling that completely occupies the mind uncontrollable persistence of an idea sometimes associated with psychiatric disorder. Um, I'll claim the truth around that, you know, like for sure, obsession uh, is psychotic. It, it's, for me, it can be at a psychotic level. Um, let's go to the next slide. And talk about what does obsession look like? Not everybody uses obsession in the same way. Um, so some of these are like favorite ways to use for me. And then other ones are ones I just use in between when my favorite ones stop working. Um, so digging in your head, desperately trying to figure it out. That is one of my favorites. Um, and you know, when I sit back and really look at it, you know, through, through step work and, and self-reflection and trying to figure out how to take better care of myself in my code of recovery, um, I mean, it's, it's desperate, you know, it's um, clawing at information or pieces of information or little facts or tidbits or hints of things to try to piece it together, like, like somehow that's the answer. I'm treating obsession like, like my higher power is, like it's my higher power. Um, worrying about something that might happen in the future and all the possible scenarios. Um, just going through them like slides in my head, you know, oh, this, oh, that, oh, this, oh, that, you know, and building up and building up and building up. Idealizing or romanticizing about something or someone that you want. 
um, you know, for me, that, that description is like my love addiction, how I'll take my um, partner and put them on a pedestal and make them my whole world. And they're so great because, and they this and they that, and I feel so awesome. And it's all so wonderful. And I get feelings of euphoria and I feel comfort and I feel safety and I feel loved and appreciated. And, and, um, but it's not truly right sized. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not seeing them all of who they are. I'm fixing my feelings with the, you know, the, the fantasy stories I make up about this person. Um, they have no flaws. They'll never hurt me. They'll never leave me. Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, trying to find the perfect thought that will make sense of everything or fix everything and tell you what to do. Um, and that, that truly comes, for me, that comes from my little girl inside who believes that there's one right perfect thing out there, you know, one, one right perfect action, one right perfect thought, one, one you know, and sh she's looking for that, the, the thing that will make it all okay, that will make it all go away, that, you know, that will make someone happy, whatever that is. And if I just go in my head and find it in there, then I'm going to be safe. Um, fix, fixating on a person to figure them out. And this may be somebody that I'm hurt by, angry with. It may be somebody that I, I want to draw into my life. It may be somebody that's triggered abandonment for me, um, uh, or somebody that, you know, that I want to, um, that I feel somehow unsafe around. Usually it's fear, you know, that, that drives me to try to figure somebody out and analyze them and break them down into, all these characteristics, you know, and uh, with obsession, I'm generally not doing that in a healthy or honest way. I'm usually looking for something in them that's going to fix me, that's going to give me a one up, or that's going to make me feel safe and protected by them. Like I'm looking for something specific to fix my feelings. I'm making stories up about what someone will think, say, feel, or do. And again, medicating my powerlessness over. Like, I really don't have any power over what somebody thinks, says, feels, or does, what they decide to do. So um, if I make up those stories and I, like, kind of try that on, then I get to feel better for a minute or feel in control for a minute in my obsession. Um, replaying over and over what someone did to you and building up resentment or victimization. And while I'm going through these, I want you guys to, um, uh, you know, identify the identify in here what it is how you how obsession works for you um what you know what your method of using obsession can look like um uh so we're playing over and over what someone did to you and building up resentment or victimization so um oh i was stuck in that for years over my divorce and um and just kept going back there and back there and back there to, to, to what? I mean, really just to, I'm, you know, I'm thinking that I'm going to find some little tidbit or morsel or hope or hint or I, you know, what am I really looking for there? You know, I'm looking for some resolution. I'm looking for it to be over. You know, I, I start out looking for some kind of, I'm looking for my peace there in a relationship that's already over. It's been over for a long time. I've already done step work on it. I've already let it go. I have no contact with this person anymore. And I still can go back to it years later. And what is it that I'm trying to achieve there? You know, it's, I, it's obsession is just addiction. I'm just doing what I've always done, trying to get a different result, the insanity of addiction. Um, Ignoring something important and daydreaming about unimportant or mundane things in our life. Again, this can be, for me, a way to avoid. So if, if this has all this energy and all this fear around it and I don't want to be here, I don't want to feel that, I don't want to look at that, this is not, today is not the day for that, you know, then I got to make something else unimportant really big and stay super focused on it in order to drive out those feelings of whatever that is that I'm avoiding. Um, and, uh, and truly that is a form of self-abandonment for me. Overanalyzing your choices when trying to make a decision until you're beating a dead horse. Kind of like that, you know, thinking that there's this one perfect answer out there that I gotta just find. 
and comparing, 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 comparing. But if I this, da 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 da, and then off on that story, and then but if I this, then off on that story. And you know, again, like making this huge catastrophic event out of this decision and scaring the crap out of myself and overwhelming myself with all those possible scenarios, you know, at the same time. Um, until I'm just so depleted, you know, I've just run out of energy around all this, and now I don't know what to do. I'm just, I've just confused the shit out of myself, you know. Um, and I thought my motive was to come to some clarity. <laughs> you know? and that's not where that lands when I'm in obsession, and I'm off in that tunnel by myself without my higher power. Uh, intensely questioning and doubting a decision that you already made. It can be in the past, it can be, I've already done that, I already came to that conclusion, maybe I even did it in a healthy way and checked it out with God, you know, and talked to some recovering people about it. But now I'm going to go back there because I don't like my powerlessness right now in this moment. I'm going to go back and reevaluate, reevaluate and stay spun out going, did I do the right thing? Well, if I would have done this, then it would have ended that way. Like, I can tell that. I mean, that's, you know, pretty much out of the boundaries that God gave me. I don't get to look at, <laughs> life is not a choose-your-own-adventure book where you can go back to that page and then go down a different road. Um, but in my obsession, I act as if that was true. Um, and, and often, in my obsession, I make assumptions into facts. Um, and uh, really, that's fantasy. Criticizing yourself with stories of what you should have done, um, that's a powerful way for me to rage in at myself. Um, again, what is it fixing? Raging at myself fixes feelings of sadness. Uh, raging at myself, I often will use to fix feelings of powerlessness or pain over what other people have done. Um, uh, you know, if, if I criticize me and I'm attacking me, then at least I'm in control of it. And, you know, I'm not. I'm out of control, you know. Um, but, but, uh, but it feels more in control than the pain that I'm just left with about someone else's decisions or, life's, or just life events. Um, so I will pick up the bat to feel some kind of control. Super sad, but, you know, that's, that's one of my codependent patterns. Um, flip-flopping with a choice or judgment until you drive yourself crazy. <clears throat> um, so, okay, ready, Linda? Obsession. So, this is kind of the, um, the key of this part for me, is it starts out like ordinary thinking, but intensifies and builds into, you know, different levels of mental self-assault and creating anxiety, panic, fear, rage, desperation, and or shame. Just like all addiction, I'm going in there to fix something, but where it takes me because I'm, I'm in self-will, I'm in self-abandonment, I'm in um, denial, you know, I'm, you know, I'm in medicating mode. Um, because of that, it doesn't work and it and I end up overusing I don't there's no such thing in an obsession as enough is enough you know I don't stop until I'm beating my head against a brick wall and um, and hurting intensely usually it's even uh, cheaper for 1600 four bedroom two and a half bath 1900 square foot Okay, I'm back. Thanks, Linda. Okay, so um, so next slide. So I'm just going to ask, uh, after reading through all those, if anybody else is feeling some shame, because I'm feeling some shame. You know, I just called my disease out um, and just talked about a lot of my shame-based shame codependent management strategies. And I just have to take a deep breath and pull my energy back in and send some loving forgiveness to me. Yes, those are behaviors that I do, that I've done a lot more in the past. And just love me and forgive me right now in this moment. You know, I did what I needed to do. Um, it's okay that I have obsession. It's okay that that has, you know, honestly, 
we're going to we're going to look a little bit about why we obsess and where it comes from and that'll allow us to accept and forgive a little bit bigger but we don't have to be ashamed of it you know we can just say you know what i'm not i'm not obsession has been part of the tools that i've used my whole life to survive and yeah it doesn't work and yeah it has caused some harm and yeah i'm ready to let it go and lovingly let it go because shaming myself into letting go of shame never works. You know, I can't shame myself out of obsession. That's going to keep me drawn right back into obsession. So I'm going to just let my higher power take that, you know, and love me through this process of getting honest with myself about how these defects of character and, and this addiction, how it just makes things worse so that I can build some healthy shame, which is, which is that, you know, it's not okay for me to self-abandon anymore. It's not okay for me to make stuff up in my head. It's not okay for me to, you know, avoid the truth and reality and my own self-care by going in my head and making up a story. You know, I, I, it, it doesn't work for me to figure you out to take care of myself better. Like, that doesn't work, you know. And, and so I have to have some healthy shame and say I'm out of my integrity and I'm out of my higher powers boundaries for me. Um, and I can accept that healthy shame will teach me how to do things different, different, you know, which is different from the toxic shame that says, I'm a piece of shit because I do this. No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a loving, wonderful, valuable human being. And I have these behaviors that don't serve me and I'm ready to let them go. And I can forgive myself and accept accept responsibility for this nobody can fix my obsession besides me and god you know and um, an obsession does harm so why do we obsess uh it manages and controls feelings for sure um you know i thought for years and years that you know i would obsess because i was trying to figure things out or um, understand better and I under and I realize those motives are in there but generally obsession is about fixing my feelings right now it's not really about caring about my relationship or understanding someone else or asking for you know what's my next best move usually obsession ends up in a place where I'm trying to fix how I feel right now um, and you know what it's keeping me from from caring about what's happening right now what's happening right now i might need a hug i might need to acknowledge that i'm scared i don't want to acknowledge i'm scared i'm just going to go straight into obsession instead and what am i doing to the to the fearful part of me i'm avoiding it i'm abandoning that i i'm not i'm not going into the message that you know you're safe heidi you're safe no matter what you're safe no matter what because I'm here and I care about you and we're going to pay attention to life and do the best that we can and we have good resources. I just might need some comfort. I just might need, you know, to breathe and and care about myself. But no, I'm going to go up here in my head. You know, fear isn't in my head. Fear is in my heart. This is the part of me that needs my care. The part that needs to take a deep breath and relax you know the part that needs to like let the weight come off my shoulders but i'm going to escape all that and run up here and blah blah, blah 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 you know um and think that the answer is up there when the answer is really being in my body being in my wholeness breathing slowing my nervous system down um and those kinds of things but i'm going to avoid this go up here you know stuff my feelings and they're just going to pop out later again and then i have to obsess harder later so uh that's how that looks for me um intense focused detailed obsessive thinking drives out feelings or creates new feelings to grow stronger and drive out the ones we don't want so for example if i focus on my fears i can drive out loneliness if I focus on angry thoughts, I can drive out feelings of powerlessness. If I focus on fantasy thoughts, like, oh, it's so great, it's gonna be so great, he'll never leave me, you know, she's my best, best friend, you know, and, and those kinds of fantasy thoughts 
can drive out guilt or shame. Just shut it down. Um, focusing on self-criticism can drive out pain. And for me, that's like cutting. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't know I did that forever. I mean, I did it a lot. And, and when I finally realized, like, what, are you, what is it serving? Explored it and explored it and explored it. Finally found out, like, why do I pick up the bat and beat myself up? You know, why do I not even know I'm hurting myself with that until somebody else says, you know, why don't you put down the bat? And okay, then I feel ashamed because now I'm, you know, I'm beating myself up. But I didn't even know it. Like, I'm, it's so normalized in my system to self criticize. Um, because it's actually comforting on some level and it's because it's medicating pain. So that's just my, how I use that drug. Um, but again, the steps and a lot of journaling and talking to people that are really close to you and, and sponsorship can help you come to those understandings of like, why, what are all my character defects really about? They're just a really crappy way of taking care of ourselves. So um, provides us with temporary relief, a distraction or hope, um, you know, that escaping. Uh, we are master escape artists. And uh, if I have this running story in my head of how I'm an awesome person because of blah, 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 um, you know, fill in the blank. It could be because I'm so loving or because I'm such a, because I do so much service work or because I'm a great employee or you know, because I cook so well, um, that one isn't mine. But, uh, you know, it could be because, you know, like I hike and I'm such a great backpacker, you know, something that gives me an identity. Um, and just go in and obs obsess about that running story, you know, um, and that can medicate and fix other areas of my life that I have deep shame around or guilt around that need my time and attention to clear those out and comfort those and get right-sized with whatever mistakes I've made or whatever judgments are there, whatever wounds have been passed down from someone else or someone else's behavior. Um, so obsession keeps me distracted from all that. So obsess obsession offers connection with others when we obsess together, like using buddies. And that became a powerful uh, awareness for me to recognize when there's certain people that I call that will use with me and obsess with me and listen to me go over the story of what he did to me and how he did it and why he's such a creep and blah, 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 and I this and I that. And okay, so then I'm getting my martyr fix. I'm getting my victim fix. I'm getting one up big time in there. Uh, I'm getting a lot of poor me, you know, and I've got this person on the other end of the phone, you know, that's, that's enabling. and um, and so, you know, I want to stop that cycle of getting people to join in in my using behaviors and be using buddies with me. Um, and it used to be that all of my relationships were based on that. My women relationships were all using buddies. Um, uh, and, you know, as we get healthier, those behaviors drop away and we, and we, we learn how to um, value each other and encourage each other and, and, um, and validate each other instead of uh, use together. So over time, um, creating conversation in your head to avoid feeling alone, like white noise. Um, yeah, who feels lonely when you're in obsession? You know, it's, it's a great way to fill your head with all this stuff and, and not just learn to sit with you, sit with you, sit with your feelings. Um, and um and feel like you know for me i didn't know for years i was lonely uh because i was so busy all the time you know busy out here in the world and then and then if nothing's going on out here i'm super busy in here with obsession and when you know and and it's like well i just can't meditate i don't know why i just can't slow my thoughts down well I, the last thing i wanted to do was be alone I certainly didn't want to be alone with me because when I was alone with me, it usually didn't feel great. But as I tackled that in my recovery and, and got better and better at being alone and then realized that like, I'm not a very good companion for me. I'm pretty mean to me. Um, I'm, I, I dismiss my hurt and my pain and my sadness and I tell myself it should be different. And I 
should be, should be, should be, should all over myself. Um, and, uh, and then going, okay, well, how do you do that different? Well, okay, you have loving thoughts. And it feels like it takes so much energy to muster up like an affirmation, you know, <laughs> because all my thinking is geared towards finding, finding things wrong with me. And, and it was like, I was like, oh, I'm going to pop out something like, I am enough, you know, and then, and then, okay, oh, ugh, ugh. And, uh, and over time, we train our brain differently. We train our brain to not be disgusted with affirmations. I don't know if anybody else can relate to that, but I used to do affirmations and just feel more disgusted by them because all my brain said is like, that's a bunch of horse shit, you know? Over time, I've matured and, and, and it's not horse shit. I am beautiful and I am enough and I am a wonderful spirit and, and I am a good friend and I'm a good mom. And, and, and I've learned how to believe those things, just like I learned how to believe that I was a piece of shit and I was never going to do it right. And, and, you know, my life is a mess and I'll never figure this out. I, I just, I told myself all that stuff for years and I believed it. Well, tell yourself something different and you'll believe it too. And it will be the life that you live. Um, God, it sounds so simple from here, but it takes a lot of years of work for me. For me, it did. But it's one thought at a time. Um, to create the illusion of some power or choice in a powerless situation. And, you know, again, powerlessness was a big trigger for me, still can be. Um, and so I'm going to, if I, you know, if I'm powerless over something, I'm going to want to try to imagine some power around it um, instead of feeling safe in the surrender. And that's what I've learned how to do is feel safe in the surrender. But that skill doesn't happen. That muscle doesn't build until you stop using what you were using to feel safe. And that means allowing the powerlessness to come in, which means stopping obsessing and escaping it. So again, we are master escape artists. Um, to avoid fear of commitment by alternating different choice scenarios. Um, staying on the fence. So if I've got big fear of commitment, you know, which comes with that, the belief that I'm going to screw this up, I'm going to do it wrong, people are going to blame me, I'm going to blame me. If I do it wrong, then I'm going to beat myself up about this and have regret the rest of my life. And those kinds of stories, they keep us paralyzed from actually making a decision saying, all right, I check this out with God. I, I've done my due diligence on this. This feels like the right thing to do. I'm going to just trust that and move forward. And instead, I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, and uh, because I'm so afraid of that commitment to a decision. Um, seeking the thought, fantasy, story, scenario, or answer to create a good feeling to medicate bad feelings. Um, you know, it's, it's again, it, like I call it carpet roving because I'm a drug addict. And... I literally have carpet roved before. And, you know, I, 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 it's the same thing in my head. You know, I am just like digging for the thought that I can, you know, put some belief into and then have a flood of endorphins or a flood of adrenaline or a flood of some other feeling rather than just sit here in this feeling of sadness or fear or whatever. And I'm literally carpet roving looking for that thought, and obsession is how I do it. Um, family role modeling. So taking a look at how our parents handled decisions, disappointment, being hurt, or having disagreements. That is, those are powerful, built-in systems that we have to work hard at releasing, letting go, questioning, building awareness around, surrendering, trying something new, and then repetitively doing it until it becomes habit, you know, to, to check in with ourselves. How am I feeling? How, what, what do I, what am I needing right now? Um, you know, feelings don't just automatically make me want to go stick my head in the sand anymore or get up in my head to avoid my feelings. Um, and that has taken some, some muscle to get there. Um, thinking is like a place to go away to. It seems safer than being or feeling. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, you know, I, I used to, um, 
I used to actually look forward to time alone when I could just obsess un uninterrupted in my head, <laughs> you know, um, that like, like, like a placeholder, like something that I'm wanting, some kind of juicy tidbit that I'm wanting to obsess about and being like, oh, I know I have time on my commute to work or later after work on my way home or, you know, like when I go to bed, you know, like the last place I should be obsessing is like trying to put myself to sleep at night, right? But it's like, it's like, oh, I can figure that out then, and you know, um, and it was really just, it was almost like later I can have a beer, you know? I mean, that's, I knew I was doing that. I mean, I knew that I could feel better if I can obsess. Um, and I looked forward to doing it. Um, unfortunately, I don't stop when I feel better. I keep going until I feel horrible again. And that's because it's addiction. Um, so as children in dysfunctional homes, our choices were limited. And thinking was one thing we could control to get relief. So God bless us. We, we did what we had to do to get by. Um, and, you know, I know for me that, that my, it wasn't safe to be in here. You know, wasn't, this was a way better place to go away to. Uh, when I was a child, and I understand that that was a powerful survival tool for me, and I commend me for doing anything and everything that I needed to do to get by at that rough time in my life until I could learn some better skills and surround myself with some healthier people and make myself into a healthier self-parent. Um, and the critical demanding voice of obsession may feel like home and offer comfort even though it's doing harm. Um, you know, uh, a home, the home that I grew up in had a lot of rage, had a lot of um, attacks, had a lot of uh, crying, had a lot of shame spirals, had a lot of drama, um, had a lot of pain. And, you know, like, why would I want to recreate all that stuff as I grow up? Why would I be attracted to people who do the same things to me? Um, because that's home. It's what I know. It, you know, it's, I'm, I, my whole development, you know, through all of my years taught me how to deal with that to get my needs met as best as I could. I don't have a concept of a world out there outside of that whole drama. I do, but it's kind of empty and blank. I don't have any experience with it. So, so yeah, of course I'm going to draw the same things. Um, and that on some level I get comfort out of it. It's built into my, you know, into my survival. So. Okay, so that's why you guys might have lots of other whys, um, but this is, this is the whys I know about. So let's uh, go to the next slide. Um, so this, the key for this section is it's not actually making our lives better or different. It only makes our feelings better or different um, and that was a powerful uh, awareness for me like first step bottom kind of stuff is that all the time that I spend obsessing about my relationship or my job or you know how to manage my time or you know how I should arrange my furniture or or what I should do with my backyard or what you know I'm not caring about any of those things if I'm using obsession um, I'm just fixing my feelings right now. I'm just generally shame, generally just fixing shame right now. And, and, you know, all of my life is just these juicy materials to fix my shame right now. So I'm actually neglecting my whole life and using all that to just fix my feelings right now, um, which doesn't truly fix anything. In truth, obsession is a drug, and when we use it, we are avoiding and neglecting our lives, our feelings, and ourselves. Next slide. So what does it cost us? Uh, for me, usually ends up in a shame spiral, overreacting, um, you know, build up, build up, build up, build up in my head, and then it doesn't take very much for me to fall off, you know, and and overreact to what somebody, it's just, all it takes is a look. When I've built something up into this big thing, all it takes is a look or another thought or some, just, it just takes nothing. Um, frozen sometimes, um, 
resentful, feeling very alone, beat up, or hopeless. And usually the beat up part is, is the most shameful feeling for me, um, that I'll never figure this out feeling. Um, and until the next time I pick up and then like, oh, I can figure this out, and then I'm off and running again. Um, like all addictions, it progresses, so we have to use harder just to feel normal. The addiction tells us that the problem is out there when the biggest problem is now the addiction itself. Um, so I'm searching, searching, digging, 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 trying to figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. Um, but really, I could just back off and just be okay. But I don't know how to do that because I'm an addict. And obsession and addiction is how I spend all my time if I'm not conversing with somebody or at my desk at work or doing dishes. And sometimes it's all going on in the background. Even while I'm doing those things, I can be in some level of obsession in the background. Um, over time, the addiction becomes normalized and transparent to us, even though we're not getting much relief. I don't know if anybody can relate to that, but obsession definitely had outlived its usefulness in my life a long time before I ever was able to stop or intervene. Um, we learned to, to catastrophize things so we have more material for our addiction and to justify why we do it. Um, and, you know, this is not something I'm proud of, but I, I like to remember that, you know, becoming aware of when, like, something really crappy or horrible would happen, or I would find out something really crappy or horrible, um, and, and somehow I'm actually getting a little bit high off of that because now it's something that I can obsess about or victimize myself about um, or um, it's material to obsess about like how does this fit into the whole big puzzle of whatever and you know like it might be some fact that somebody shares about somebody that I have history with and I'll take that fact and I'll be like ooh, put that in my back pocket for later because later I can obsess and figure out how that all fits into the big you know, that big card house of fantasy that I have built about this person and give me a little one up or, or give me a little, now I'm a victim or give me a little something, you know, and, you know, I'm not proud of that, but that is my codependence, you know, in the background, always looking for something to fix that shame, um, always looking for that little one up or always looking for that justification of, of being victimized or, um, um, you know, now this, now I'll get a better martyr fix out of this or whatever. It's, it's, a, it's just, it's just fixing. Um, so as the addiction progresses, we often scare ourselves into a state of paralysis and can't do anything. Um, I've, I, I have spun out on certain topics for so long and catastrophized every possible scenario where I'm just, I'm just terrified to do anything wrong. You know, I've played it out in so many one-ups and one-downs that now it's so toxic that there's nothing I can do right. I've made it into such an amazing, this will fix everything on the one hand, and then over here, like, the worst case scenarios are going on, and now I'm just terrified to even do anything. Um, Often we forget how to feel and intellectualize our feelings instead and creating toxicity and disease. Again, just stuffing, stuffing, stuffing feelings, staying busy up here, busy, 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 busy stuffing, 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 stuffing. Um, and, um, and I'm thinking sadness and I'm thinking anger and I'm thinking love. You know, I'm not actually feeling those things in my body. Um, we try alternating multiple obsessions in order to manage the consequences. So kind of like switching drugs. Um, so I might be obsessed over here with the boyfriend and, you know, the problems that we're having and what I'm making up that he should be doing or, or why he shouldn't do or shouldn't or whatever, you know, I'm making up all those stories. And when that stops working and I have a shame spiral and I've exhausted myself over there, then I've got this other obsession over here that I'll pick up and use instead to medicate and put that down for a while. Um, so that's just an example of, of how I'll do that. Um, thinking about things eventually leads to acting on them. 
and the unmanageability intensifies as we overreact. You know, building up, building up, building up. Um, Oh, it, as I share about these things, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I have recovery around this stuff because I do it so much less and, and my life is so sweeter now. And, and uh, I, it makes me sad to think of all that overwhelm and this, this is it. Eventually we can feel trapped in a cycle of confusion and overwhelm as if our life is a puzzle we can never figure out. And it's just obsession. It's not my life. It really is obsession. That's what I'm doing, you know. My life is good. And, you know, years into my recovery, you know, taking an honest look at that and going, you know, I, I am safe now. I do have loving people in my life. I'm stable. I have a good job. I quit drugs. I, I, I take really good care of myself. I, I have wonderful hobbies. Um, you know, I... I I have the sanctity of my home that I've made an amazing place for me to, to reside and, and heal and love and grow. And like, why am I still so unhappy? What am I doing wrong? Like, what am I still doing? And it was obsession. That's, that, it all came down to obsession. Okay, next slide. So the key for this part is that, that it just doesn't work. Um, when has it ever helped you gain clarity or make better decisions? Yeah, not, not so much for me. Um, and especially because uh, there's no room for my higher power in there. You know, there's no room for taking a breath and checking it out with my gut, you know, checking it out with my heart. Um, letting some time pass, um, um, you know, feeling it out for a minute. Uh, you know, decisions don't just come from an intellectual place. You know, decisions are a whole body experience and, you know, body, mind, and spirit. And so my mind is a part of that, but so is the rest of me. And when I'm in obsession, I'm just analyzing and listing things out and pros and cons and, you know, and not paying attention to all the other data that goes into seeking my higher power's will and, you know, the, the, next, the next right thing for me in my life. Um, so working the steps, um, I want us to do this. And, uh, you know, actually, I hope that people have some pen and paper and they're ready to walk through this. We're gonna do it together. Um, and, um, and I would like for some people to, uh, share to some of the questions. And I think what we're going to do is ask people to raise their hands, um, to answer questions. So Linda or Christina, can you guys offer some guidance around how that's going to look for this part? Are you guys there? Knock, knock. Hello. Looks like you're muted. Christina, can you unmute yourself? There you go. Okay, I had to step away. What? What did you need me to do? Well, we're on the working the steps, and so I just kind of wanted to describe to people how they would raise their hand. Well, that's that's a good question. Um, I thought that we could go to the chat box, and they can um, say, "I'd like to share next in the chat box." We could have them raise their hand, but that but we have eighty five people on here, and it might be hard to navigate that. So. I'd like them to um, type a message in and then we can call on them. Uh, Linda had a different idea about actually people having like the rate using the reactions part. What do you think about that? That's good. If that, yeah, Linda, can you um, manage that? 
Yep. So you can either you can either type into the chat box that you want to share, or you can hit your reaction button and raise your hand, and we'll call on you. Okay. So which one of you is going to be sort of helping to orchestrate that with? Linda. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Carls. All right. Okay. Um, before we do that, I want to just check in with everybody and see if anybody had any comments or questions. Let's just take a couple minutes to connect with each other. So if you, so if you hover over the bottom of your window, and I hope this is true for everyone, but it's, it's what my screen does, there's a little... Uh, I gotta unmute me. Okay. I unmute you, sorry. All right, I'm in. okay, thank you. So there's a little, uh, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, there's a button called reactions. And if you click on that, it has a thumbs up and then it has like a, a hands clapping thing. So hit the hands clapping thing because then you'll, you're, uh, you'll get a little uh, symbol on your little window face. Um, I'm so technical. And <laughs> like mine right. um, and then basically that we're going to use that as the raised hand there's another raise hand function in here but we're not going to use that so Heidi do you want them to complete each of these bullet points and then share or are we going to go down through each bullet point one by we're going to walk down through them and try it that way yeah but first I wanted to see if anybody had any um if any, if if we're all on board, or if anyone has any questions about the content so far, I don't want to spend too much time because uh, we do have a lot of material to cover. Okay. Linda, can you see everybody's face at the same time? Yeah. Well, I have to scroll through. I'm looking, and I don't see any hands up. Christina, do you have anyone in the chat box that wants to ask a question or share? I don't, let me look in the chat box real quick. Okay. No questions yet, but Heidi, you were getting a lot of like, during your presentation, you were getting a lot of, do. I think that way too. Oh my okay. God, that's so me. I think everyone right now is working on their bullet points. Okay, great. Great. Okay. Well, we'll just keep working on it then. Um, everybody thinks okay. you're fabulous, Heidi. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, so step one, we admitted that we were powerless over obsession, that our lives had become unmanageable. What are at least two topics of obsession you have engaged in? Um, and... You know, the, I guess the bigger question is really, what obsession are you ready to give up right now? Um, but uh, as far as like two topics of obsession, I will share that right now, my biggest obsession is um, feeling sorry for myself. I have some self-pity going on about the long hours that I've been working. And the story around that is that like, uh, everybody else has so much time because they're on quarantine and I'm working 50 or 60 hours a week and when, when, when for me. Um, and, you know, building up some victimization in that, um, you know, building up a fantasy story about, um, about you know, that there's, this, there's this other alternate universe out there where I would be so happy. <laughs> That's one of my favorite using tools, fantasies. Um, and uh, and um, and that I'm the only one suffering. You know, there's there's this. You know, part of that story is this self-centeredness of thinking that I'm the only one suffering. Like I'm so alone in my suffering. The rest of the world has it so good. People are dying. I mean, this is such a lie in my head. This is such a a fix. You know, it's it's such a, a fabricated story for me. Um, and so, you know, I have to admit that, that, that that's 
part of what's going on um, is that I, I want to go into that story of my victimization around how many hours I'm working. I'm, I do HR stuff and this is a big HR time right now for everybody to try to understand all of the quarantine, you know, rules around, you know, um, employment. And so that's where I've been. But uh, so, yeah, okay, I'm going to just stop with that. Um, and the other thing that I've been obsessing about a lot is uh, my daughter. She is uh, struggling right now with uh, anxiety and some depression and her grades. And she's 13, and that is age appropriate for her. And, um, you know, it, it, it brings up a lot of feelings for me. I feel very powerless around it. Um, there's a lot of conflict in our relationship. Um, and uh, and I, codependence is getting triggered like crazy. I want to fix her. I want to change what she does, change how she feels. I want to, you know, climb in her head and, you know, take things off and repaint. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to feel powerless. Um, I don't want to feel fear. Um, and so I, I have a tendency to obsess instead. So I've been checking in with that. Um, so those are those are my two that I'm struggling with right now that I'm happy to turn over today. Um, so I'd like to open up uh, the floor for someone else to share about topics that they are ready to surrender today. Okay, um, Paul would like to share. Paul, if you can um, unmute yourself and go ahead. Can you because her, oh, okay. Hey, hey. hi. Uh, well, well, thanks so much for this. Um, <clears throat> I, I find that, that, that I go through ob obsession or, or as it's like um, uh, kind of an easy term for it or easy way to describe it is I'd say panic attacks. So mm -hmm. if I get triggered or I feel terrified or extremely angry, it's like, it's like my mind goes into a loop, 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 loop. And um, I, I kind of, the analogy that, I, that I'm using, I don't know if anyone can relate, is that it's like a, your computer goes on a loop and, and it's like, I feel like I'm the computer and I can't, I can't, I, I'm in panic. So, so I can't go, I can't think, oh, I just hit, I just go control all delete and then, you know, reboot or something like that. I have to, I have to call my you know, call my uncle, call my friend, call my cousin. Uh, if, if I call my parents, they, they get annoyed because they, I think they feel disappointed that I, I'm my age and I still go through these, you know, th th these, uh, you know, panic things. Right. Um, but, but for me, I, I know you can't do everything yourself and you're not all in your head, but for me, the, the challenge is how to ground myself and regulate myself when i'm in that obsession in that panic it seems really hard i mean i do do go to different groups it, it's just it's it's so hard and and, and like you you had mentioned before um i think heidi you had said that is that you're a little addicted to the to the to the terror to the bad stuff yeah so, so in, in, in a way i i almost think that my, my um core addiction is to feeling bad is, is my brain is addicted to feeling bad yeah and, it's, it's, and i go through periods where i feel happy i'm good there's nothing wrong with me something will trigger me boom take me right back down to w what to heal or to have a different thought yeah and um i'll i'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll stop here but it's it, for me i found it's it's very hard to do on my own you know like you learn techniques and that and, you know tapping or this or that or breath and you know go to a meeting but and it's a challenge and then when, when i saw this topic i'm like yeah this is uh this is worthwhile <laughs> thank you thank you paul thanks for sharing um so what does obsession look like for you i would like uh to ask for somebody to share what in the list, did they check um, on the what does obsession look like?
Linda, can you put that slide up? That was the first slide, I think, the first presentation slide. So who would like to share what, which ones of these look, uh, or, you know, are areas where they struggle? Aman, were you willing to share on this? Yes, I am. Okay, perfect. Hi, Aman. I'm a codependent. Um, thank you so much, Heidi, for the presentation. Hi, Oops. Hi. Um, so I wrote down uh, a couple of things. Uh, Think. So one of the, my obsessions is um, related to the welfare of people I care about. Um, so in particular, uh, when say I have a friend or a family member who has um, maybe mental health or if they have addiction um, and there's, you know, kind of this co, whether they have addiction and like some mental health, um, I kind of worry about, you know, whether I can save them. And I think for me, and, and what it actually looks like is, you know, maybe making suggestions for them to go to see a doctor, trying to make interventions for therapy, suggesting certain, um, just kind of crossing that boundary, you know, where I should just say, if they come to me, you know, be that outstretched hand, but I'm actually kind of suggesting interventions. And, um, and I think that comes from the fact that I had a close family member who I lost to mental health and I, and I never knew about it and, you know, I didn't see it. And I, I think when it comes to people who I'm close to, I'm just trying to get there before it happens. And, um, and another thing is about feeling good about like bad stuff. I I read somewhere there's like a German word for you know if like some feeling some kind of joy in misfortune. And um and I spent some time thinking about it and I think it's because I've had when I've had like traumatic news you know, it's always, whether it's a phone ringing, I get so stressed, you know, and go to the worst case scenario. And it's, I don't know whether it's like my body just trying to not give the fear response. So I'm like trying to feel joy to not feel actually the pain of, of, um, of what the news could be. So I try and like kind of enjoy it whereby I know actually like, and it makes me question whether, you know, I'm empathic or, and that causes me a lot of shame. But um, yeah, those are, those are, those are the two things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good awareness. Thank you. Linda, you want to introduce the next person? Yes. Uh, hang on. I'm keeping a running list. So okay. Michelle is next. Okay, we don't want to spend too much time on this one question, though. So whoever signs up might uh, need to answer the next question, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. okay. Michelle? Okay. Hi, Heidi. Okay. I'm Hi, Michelle. Michelle. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, this has been great so far. So um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, because it keeps giving me messages. All right. So, which question did you did you want me to answer? This one of which ones of these I'm kind of doing or have caught my yeah. Attention? Like, what what does obsession look like for you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, pretty much all of the stuff that you mentioned, I've done at one point or another, kind of going around in my head like chasing squirrels, <laughs> and so you know, jumping from one aspect of obsession to another aspect um i mean recently it's been um house shopping and puppies have been the two things that i've been like hyper focusing on and um when you say obsession that's it's definitely obsession 
um, when you spend, you know, five, six hours a day on one thing on your computer or your phone. And, you know, then getting to the place where during that obsession, like, there's a lot of fear and um, desperation. Like, if I don't find the perfect this or the perfect that, the perfect puppy, the perfect house, or if it's there and I miss it, it's like the end of the world. It's like that's the only yeah. opportunity I'll ever get. And then right. where is that coming from? You know, where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from wanting to fix something inside. So yeah. you know, a lot of what you said about like the inner child stuff, I've been doing work on that recently. And, um, and you know, it's, it's bringing up a lot of feelings and a lot of stuff from my past. And so the other day I was able to identify that the inner child work was bringing out more of my disease. And so that's where the obsession is coming from or why it's stronger now. I mean, it's coming from being an addict and that's what addicts do. But then, you know, bringing up all these feelings from when I was young and working on the inner child stuff is kind of making my disease want to reach for all this outside stuff to fix me. And yeah. so, yeah, so what you talked about and all of these things of what does your obsession look like, it's looked like all of those things at different times. Um, I would say that that first one of digging in your head, desperately trying to figure it out is a really big one for me. Um, mm -hmm. And then I also do the beating myself up one where I criticize myself with stories of what I should have done. So after I obsess, 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 and then I finally make a decision, it doesn't matter what the decision is, I'm gonna beat myself up for it because I didn't do the other thing because I analyzed it so much that I know all the different sides. So no matter yeah. what I decide, there's always something that I didn't take that I lost, right? So I beat myself up for that, so. Right, right, totally got it, yeah. I call myself my own worst enemy, right? And so my yeah. fear is what I'll do to me. You know, it's not really the outcome of the decision, it's what am I gonna do to myself after I make this decision, so. Right, right. Yeah. That's so good, that's good awareness. That's what it looks like for me, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Glad you're here. Me too, thank you. Okay, so next one is, what are two ways that you have unsuccessfully tried to stop, control, justify, rationalize, or minimize your obsession? And um, I'll share a couple real quick. Um, so to justify obsession, I have often blamed others. Um, that, you know, I, I'm entitled to obsessing about what he did to me because what he did was so horrible, you know, so it's really his fault that I have to obsess about it. <laughs> like, you know, like you would obsess too, you know. Um, so, you know, which, which again is amplifying, you know, my, my victimization, you know, and, and milking my victimization for me to feel important or one up or, um, you know, validated in my pain or something, you know, and um, so it's, so not only did he do that to me, he also did it and made me obsessed too <laughs> for years. You know? Okay, I just have to laugh. Okay, and then, and then, um, uh, you know, I've often tried to control obsession by um, avoiding the topic completely. Like if I'm, obsessing about like let's say him okay it, the, the breakup and um and so and so then i i hit a bottom or i'm in so much pain or i shame spiral and go oh my god i gotta stop thinking about him so now i'm avoiding thinking about him um instead of thinking about my feelings around it which are usually what needs the attention my pain my feelings uh, me directing my life into god's hands um you know, around the breakup, taking care of my emotions that are coming up um, around it, then I'm going to avoid the whole thing and pretend that I'm needless. It didn't matter to me anyway. I'm better off without him. And I'm going to go into this avoidance and needlessness um, to medicate the obsession. But it's always going to lead me right back to the obsession because needlessness is, again, self-abandonment. And then once I'm abandoned for such a long time, I'm going to have to go like, Oh, I miss him. And then there we go again. And I'll be off and running one more time. So 
Um, so I'd like someone else to share, whoever our next person is in line, if they are willing, um, about how you've tried to unsuccessfully uh, manage or stop or control um, your obsession. Okay, Danielle is the next person to share. Um, so I think I'll just, I'm going to going back to the first part, sorry. Um, like trying to soundry with someone and not doing it, so then I'm obsessing, it was about obsessing about how they're going to respond, so how to stop that obsessing, I, what was just said by Heidi, I'm either avoiding it, so I did this this last week, I was needing to set a boundary, and obviously I'm not seeing someone in person, so I needed to text or phone call, and that person's still texting and calling me for like two or three days, so I'm totally avoiding them, then I decide, well, what if I just turn my phone off for the entire day, but now I'm avoiding everyone, and yeah. it, so it totally doesn't work, or yes, then mm -hmm. I try and then I just fill it with another obsession. Okay, well, I'm not going to obsess about this boundary I have to set because I'm so fearful of what that person's going to respond is. So let's find another obsession to do over here instead. So that's how I try it. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Um, the next question is, um, I'm going to skip to, do you believe obsession has caused you to harm yourself or others and how? Okay, um, Barbara is next. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Barbara and I'm Coda. Uh, hi, so, Barbara. Do, uh, do I feel like obsession? I'm sorry, let me, I was in the middle of getting a snack. Uh, of I mean, course you are. <laughs> okay. It's do, what was the question? Do I feel like what? Do you believe obsession has caused you to harm yourself or others and how? Yes. Uh, it, it's harming my, my state of mind and my peace. And it's harming others because I'm acting out on the obsession, and and then when I think about it at the end of the day, and reflect, gosh, then I obsess on that different. And a lot of the times, I act out on the obsession. Well, not a lot. I try not to, but the last times that I've acted out on my obsessions, I ended up. Uh, I went to my kids, my kids, dad's, my kids, dad's house to try to drop them off a, a birthday card, and 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 because I couldn't stop thinking about it, and then uh, his wife met up with me and told me, she encouraged me to go there, but I think so she can make a police report saying I try to push my way in, but. I obsessed so much that I believed her that she was there to help me see my kids. And it, it just turned out to be a big old catastrophe. Like, he started yelling. Supposedly, I scared my girls. And it just, it just, it just makes me not in peace when I obsess. And I don't know sometimes how to obsess. I feel a lot of avoiding, like you guys said, you know, uh, but then I'm like, I'm in recovery to face things, but if I face things, I obsess, so. Right, right. It, that's a really good point that we, you know, we think that avoiding is the solution for addiction, and then, you know, obsession is the solution for neglect. <laughs> <laughs> Neither one of those really serve us, you know. We've got to learn how to face things moderately and, um, and, not try to control them, but care for them, you know, and uh, obsession is the best care we know often, you know, and then, um, and then, and then to fix obsession, we avoid, which leads us right back to obsession, because it's neglect. So, yeah, thank you for sharing, Barbara. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to step two. Uh, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. 
Um, so, do you believe that your higher power is capable of helping you arrest your obsession? And why? Uh, what have you expected obsession to fix, and how was that insane? And what would sanity look like to you in making decisions or seeking better understanding? So, would someone like to share on step two? The next person in line is Alex. Hello, this is Alex, codependent. Hey, Alex. Uh, yeah, par greater than ourselves. I mean, I, I, I've been in a relationship for a while, but I have an obsessive personality. I mean, you know, my, my place has to be clean. Everything has to be, I was just straightening my pictures because they're off like a quarter of an inch from each other, you know, and, and uh, just try to stay busy and then make a list that gets longer and longer and longer. And I can never finish the list because I keep adding to it. And then at the end of the day, beat myself up because I didn't get to hardly anything on the list because I was busy making more lists. And, and uh, that, that's, a, that's a huge thing for me. And, and to let go and let God and slow down is, is, uh, is so tough. But, but I love this because uh, I can't even believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I mean, that's, that's what I need to do. I need to get better at that. I don't beat myself up, shame myself. But uh and and rely more on that you know and instead of uh making making sure everything's perfect make writing this list and getting uh, shaming myself at the end of the day because i didn't get everything done on the list i mean it's it's a crazy pattern so yeah. i i just need to you know, make some time to slow down and make some time to meditate and actually set some time aside uh and and feel something you know, because when I'm assessing like that, I don't feel a freaking thing. I'm too busy to feel anything. Yeah, but exactly. I know that I know feeling is the answer. You know, and and I know in my case, I I'm not good at uh, uh, sadness and expressing grief and getting in touch with my those kind of emotions. But you know, I know those are the most important for for healing. So that's something I uh, something a goal of mine. Anyhow, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, we'll do anything to avoid feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the insanity, you know, is that we go to obsession like it was our best friend. We go to obsession like it's, you know, like it's a god, like it's our higher power, like it, like it has all the answers, like it can provide, you know, amazing, miraculous results. <laughs> <laughs> Never has, you know. Uh, but we continue to persevere that, you know, surely the answer to everything is up in my head somewhere. I just have to, <laughs> you know. Um, so thanks for sharing, Alex. Thanks, Heidi. Heidi, do you want someone else on this, on step two? Um, yeah, sure. Okay, Sarah is next. Hi, I'm Sarah, um, codependent. Hi, Sarah. Um, hi, I just want to say thank you for all of this first, just because it makes me feel not so crazy. Because <laughs> right. it's, it's such an issue that I have, and it's all just making so much sense um, to me. But with step two, uh, it's like the first question, do I believe, you know, that my higher power can help me arrest um, obsession? And I think now that I have the understanding of that's what I'm doing is trying to avoid the feelings. I've seen my higher power um, effectively help me with other things. And so that gives me the hope and the courage that my higher power can, you know, help me with this because ultimately, since I was a little girl, you know, I was my higher power. I was going to fix it and, and keep myself safe. And so um, that hasn't worked. It's, I'm 40. It's not worked. And it's not something that I want to continue doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I was, you know, it's like the piece about I wanted my obsession to fix the feelings of loneliness. You know, I didn't really connect with that until you were sharing about that and then I would, you know, deny that I felt bad that the last guy that I was with didn't want to be with me or my husband, 
you know, cheated on me or my parents weren't available, you know, the list that yeah. goes on with that. But, um, you know, seeing it for what it is and then realizing that, okay, I actually do need to kind of sit with this because I like to check the box. Like, okay, I felt sad about that for a minute. We're good. <laughs> and it's like, no, you do have a lifetime of things that, that you can look at. So, yeah, with that, right. have, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Heidi, um, before we move on, Heather has a question about step two. I'm going to unmute her. Okay. Go ahead, Thanks. Heather. Hi, Heidi. I just wanted to see what your ideas were about the third bullet point on that um, and what would sanity look like to you in making decisions or seeking better understanding um, and how to kind of find the balance of logically thinking about decision making versus letting it turn into obsession um, and how you would go about doing that. Um, I'm going to just be real brief with that answer because there's going to be more material later in the workshop where we're going to actually talk about that. I have um, the last page of the handout is called healthy thinking and it's um, and it's and it's the answer to that question you know really which is like what would sanity look like to me in making decisions um, and I have to have that um, so that I can place the two next to each other and say this is what's crazy this is what works you know this this is me this is me in self will this is me in God's will you know this is me in obsession this is me in healthy thinking and unfortunately, obsession is one of those addictions like, like love, like food, um, like exercise, that we can't just give up in cold turkey like meth. <laughs> you know, I can, I can never drink again and be okay. I'm not going to shrivel up and die. But if I, but, you know, if I stop thinking, I'll probably be in trouble. I've got to think to do my job. I have to think to make decisions. I have to think to get through my day. How do I have healthy thinking, you know? And how do I know when... When, you know, when it's addiction and when it's got some boundaries around it, you know. Um, so just to answer your question really quickly, I will say that, um, that uh, a lot of times for me, I can tell, you know, um, <laughs> if I do my feelings first, then my thinking is usually pretty clean. Because, you know, again, my gut instinct and my addiction is to medicate with thoughts instead of feel. And so, um, so a really, what sanity looks like to me is to have my emotional reaction and take care of it, whatever the life event is or what someone has said or whatever, you know, have my feelings about it with boundaries, with my own adult on board, with self-care, you know, and and to and then to sort out how what I think about it, you know, but to but to not fix my feelings with going into the stories about it. Um, but we'll talk more about that. But that's a great question. Thanks, Heather. Okay, so let's talk about step three. Made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. Um, how has it worked to turn your life and your will and life over to obsession? And is obsession caring? Do you believe God can care for your will in life better than obsession can? How and why? And what does faith have to do with arresting your obsession? Um, so I'd like to invite somebody to share on step three. But Jock, you would be next. Oh, hello, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, I believe faith can help in, in that uh, because of what happened to me being ignored and uh, having parents who had addiction, alcohol, and so on. So, uh, faith helps me in my lack of self belief, which uh, manifests itself in uh, procrastination. Uh, that there is something I want to do, important things, appointments, uh, I have to start a course, I have to do house, I have to do everything, but I would always constantly need reassurance before, before I, do, I start to do it or, you know, or continue doing it. So with the faith, 
then it means it, it gives me that feeling, you know, there is a higher person there and it's almost like it gives me permission to do what I have to do. So that's number one. The second part of it is also in relationship. There are certain individuals who it's not like I idolize them, but their opinion matters so much to me that it almost like hurts inside me so much if I don't get the approval or if, uh, if there is something I'm not sure from them why, you know, why they did they behave this way or, or feelings of rejection then comes up. So, so yeah, so when I think about faith, then I realize that these people are just humans like me and, you know, yeah. they are not the hack person. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Would someone else want to share on step three? Michelle, you would be next. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. Hold on. I didn't I didn't realize I had my hand raised again, but I will definitely share on step three. Okay. So um yes. For me, step three is the opposite of obsession because that's where I'm relying on my higher powers will for me instead of my own. So when I'm in, in any type of obsession, I'm assuming that I have all the power. And so that's why I'm in the obsession is that I think that I can figure out how to manipulate and control the circumstances to get what I want. And it's all up to me and God isn't in the picture at all. So for step three, for me, that's like the key to getting out of that obsession or a lot of times what I would call self-obsession. Um, you know, so turning over my will and my life and my power to a higher power and not thinking that I can have all the answers or figure out all the answers. Um, it also goes along with having humility. So um, for me, when I'm in obsession, another big part of it is pride and ego, that I'm lacking the humility to admit that I can't figure out how to fix me and that I can't manipulate and control circumstances to get my life to be what I think it needs to be to fix me. So, so for me, that's the third step and how, you know, how important it is to me when I do it. Now, being able to do it a lot of times is very hard because um, I have to beat my head against the wall long enough to realize that I've been in a session and that I'm not turning it over to my higher power. And sometimes that takes a while. Um, I can stay in that obsession for a long time before I finally say, whoa, you know, I need to turn this over to my higher power and stop trying to control and manipulate everything because that's what I've been doing. Um, so that's the big problem with step three for me is getting to the point to where I, I figure out that's what I need to be doing. Um, so I guess my goal is to be able to do that faster and faster the longer I'm in recovery. So. Anyway, that's all I have about step three. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, I feel like this might be a good time to take like a five minute break for people to stretch. And, um, and then we'll come back and go on to the, the third part, which is um, recovery tools to arrest obsession. Um, I'm Heidi, I'm codependent. Um, And uh, so I just want to, um, I just want to let everybody know that, um, you know, I just want to welcome you to uh, take the steps and, um, you know, write them out and uh, share them with your sponsor. And, uh, you know, for me, like I, you know, I, I didn't get relief around obsession until I started to take it seriously and put it in, do a first step on it and not just treat it like a defective character, but rather to really acknowledge the addiction that it is for me um, and, and put it front and center. Um, so, 
So recovery tools to arrest obsession. So um, can everybody hear me okay? My good Linda? Okay. Um, we must first have boundaries about how, when, where, what, and why we think in order to know whether we are, we're, whether we are just thinking or whether we're obsessing, like whether it's healthy or addictive thinking. Um, so that's the first place to go is to like have some boundaries. How would you define what's healthy for you instead of what's addictive? Um, for me, it's easier, it was easier to define what was addictive than it was uh, than it was to define what healthy thinking looks like. We're gonna talk about uh, some healthy thinking stuff too, but definitely defining what I know that I'm using. Um, uh, definitely for me when, um, you know, it's about feeling avoidance uh, and I can, you know, identify that I'm, um, I'm looking for something very specific. Um, that is the difference to me between uh, thinking and obsession. You know, obsessing is like the, the intensity level, the desperation around it. Um, um, you know, it feels uh, caustic or I don't, it's just the intensity around it that tells me that the difference between thinking and obsession. Um, there's, there's tension. There's tension in my body. I'm like, I lose track of the whole rest of the world. That's another sign of obsession for me is that an hour can go by that I didn't have any awareness of at all because I was so busy up here. I, I don't even know how I got to my destination that I'm driving to or what else is going on in my house or that I had just made a commitment like, you know, to do something with somebody or call someone back or, you know, and, and but there's no sense of time anymore. I've been so lost in my head um, that the rest of the world just goes away. That's obsession for me. So I've got to know what my boundaries are um, in order to know, uh, you know, if I just give myself free reign to just think as much as I want and just go whole hog and go crazy and think however I want to think, um, then the addiction is going to be making those decisions for me. So part of my self-parenting is that I have to rein that stuff in and I have to define what healthy thinking is and what addictive thinking is and what toxic thinking is. And um, so the next one is catch the obsessive thought as soon as you see it and ask your higher power to remove it. Um, so for me, that's like that first little like one up around something. And if I get that little one up around something, um, which is one of my favorite coda patterns, and then I'll go obsess about it in order to like build it, build it, build it, build it, and make it a better, you know, a better one up. Um, um, but if I see it the first time I have it, and I have some healthy shame that says, "Oh, that's a one up." There you go. That's not. We don't need that to feel safe. We don't need to feel a one up in order to be okay. That I can get right sized with that right away and surrender it before I start down that rabbit hole. Because once I start, I, it's going to have a life of its own. And um, it's way harder to intervene after five minutes when it feels really good and I've got all the endorphins flowing, you know. Um, surrender now wherever you are, and eventually you can intervene before you even start. And that's what we have to do in all addiction is like there's no right time for me to stop doing it. The right time to stop is right now, wherever now is. If I'm in obsession in this moment or if I'm not in obsession if I'm in a breakup or if I'm in a pandemic and quarantine like there's not this fantasy time when all my problems are gonna go away out there and then I'll stop obsessing I'll, I'll stop obsessing when I feel better you know that that has always been you know that message in, in my head that justifies I'm just gonna stay in this for now it just fixes it for now it just feels good for now but addiction doesn't ever solve the problem and um and there and there will be no contentment you know that is that's why for me i have to frame it as addiction because i understand that in addiction there is no moment that i will arrive when i will have thought about it enough 
you know, that, that doesn't happen in addiction. That happens in healthy thinking. That, ha that happens in my adult self with boundaries. That happens, um, you know, when I'm present, you know, and when I'm trusting God and when I know that enough is enough. But if it's addiction, if it feels good, then I'm going to do more and then do more and then do more and then do more and then keep doing more until it doesn't feel good. And I'll stop after it stops feeling good for a long time. You know, um, I'm an addict. I don't stop after two beers. I'm just barely getting started. And the same thing is true with, with uh, obsession. And so I have to frame it that way, treat it that way, admit I'm powerless, admit that if I start down that road, I won't be able to pull it in. And then just don't, just don't go. I have this tool that I use that I'm going to share with you guys and you can formulate your own version of it. But the, but the tool that I use is that I'm in a house and this house is my mind and there's this long hallway and on both sides of the hallway um, on the right is obsessions and on the left are all these doors to healthy thinking okay and the doors on the right are the ones that I naturally just want to go in. You know, I want to think about my ex. I want to think about my to-do list. I want to think about, you know, how shitty someone was to me or how perfect I'm going to be when I blah, 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 or that 10 pounds I'm going to lose, or, you know, I'm going to want to make up fantasies. Those, those doors might all be fantasies or they might be resentments. They might be, um, you know, ways that, you know, they might be goals. They might be, you know, and I'm in like, I can walk in any of those doors and make up stories and tell myself stories and medicate feelings and go in and build big victim cases for myself. I can do whatever I want to do in those rooms. Like those are, those are my using rooms. And so when I catch myself in one of those rooms, I leave immediately because there's nothing else there for me. Once I realize that I'm in obsession, the time to stop is now. And I step out and I get back in the hallway and I look at the doors on the other side of the hall. And the other side of the door, the, the other side of the hall has doors that say things like God's will or self-love or meditate or um, I am enough, you know. Um, they might say, let it go, you know. And, you know, I have no business being in the doors on the right. Like, it's addiction. There's no reason to ever be in there. Like the care of my life is going to be over here in these doors where I have boundaries, where I have healthy thinking, where I check things out and I don't go in there. If it's a topic that has a lot of um, pain around it or fear around it, or if I use really hard around that, like it's, there's big one up energy and shamelessness for me. I can't go in there without God. I have to bring my higher power into those conversations. It's the only way that I'm going to get relief from my addiction. So that little house thing in the hallway and the doors on both sides and, you know, it's a way for me to have boundaries. And it's a way for me to catch myself in a room. Here I am, been thinking about this for an hour and a half, you know, and it's starting to get yucky. It's starting to get uncomfortable in here. It, like the walls are closing in and I'm scaring myself and I'm getting, you know, I'm getting a big one up or my one up isn't working anymore. That's often when I figure out that I'm in a room because my one up that felt so good that lured me in that room to begin with now is not working um, or the fantasy fix, you know. And when I say one up, it's not always one up over someone else. It's often one up over me. Like it, the, the, the obsession could be about uh, one of my favorite ones is the diet that I'm going to go on. That's going to, I'm going to lose the weight. I'm going to never think about food again. <laughs> and it's going to make my whole life better. You know, it, it's just, it's just a fantasy that I obsess on that medicates how I feel right now. And right now my life is enough. My body is enough. And, and, Truly, nutrition and self-care and exercise is not in that room of obsession. It, like the answers are not in that room. You know, that's just medicating something. And it will lead me to feeling more body shame, more abandoned, more lost, more helpless around food addiction, around nutrition, around exercise, around balance, around moderation, uh, obsession, and that perfect plan to lose the weight 
and la, 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 the whole story, you know, like that's such a dangerous room for me. I have, I've spent so much time in that room and it never, it never solved my problems. It never helped me lose weight. I've always gained weight from doing that. Um, it never made me love my body more. It never made me take care of my body more. I just, there's nothing in that room for me, nothing. So as soon as I catch myself in that room, I leave. Go back out in the hallway and ask myself, what do I really need? And find the door that says that, you know? And it may be just breathe. So yeah, that's one of my favorite tools. So, and you know, you can find your own tool, you know, your own version of, of how you set those boundaries for yourself. Um, that tool for me is visual um, and I can, picture in my mind walking out of the door, you know, that has my ex's name on it, that I like need to not be thinking about him and trying to find my safety, sanity, or comfort from thinking about him one more time, thinking about what he may be doing, if he's thinking about me, uh, what he's going to do with his life, if he misses me or not, you know, and I just need to not be in that room. There's another room over here where I do grief work with God around letting that relationship go learning how to lo love that person for who they are, learning how to get right-sized around the risk, the healthy risks that I took to fall in love and be vulnerable, and the sadness that I feel that it didn't work out. And that's a whole different language in a whole different room. Um, so, uh, okay, surrender now wherever you are. And I already did that one. Okay, grow yourself up. Obsession is always your regressed child running your head. And, and that's it. You know, really, it comes down to obsession is when there's nobody home. You know, when there's not a, when there's not a grown up there, obsession is just what the kids do when mom's not home. You know, they, they run around, they jump on the bed, they eat all the cookies and, you know, game all day. And, and of course they would. That's what kids do. They do what feels good right now. They do what they think is the best, is, is, is what they want. And uh, so if I'm in obsession, my parent is not present and that's my responsibility to pull her up and say, okay, what's a better use of my, of my thoughts? What's, what do I really need right now? And take care of that instead of just go jump on the bed, you know? Um, confront the obsessions, shame-based lies and do power work to move the energy with strong statements. So, you know, I am safe. Um, I release this fear, I release this shame, and I surrender this obsession to my higher power. Like, that is really powerful to, to get back in your body often. Obsession, of course, is you're in your head, and you got to pull your energy back into your center. Or that's what works for me, is to pull my energy back into my center. And, like, a big, deep breath can help with that. Um, some growling can help with that. Um, but definitely, I am safe, you know, like, it's all going to be okay. I mean, I love that statement. I cannot say it to me enough. It's all going to be okay. Like, I just needed to hear that for so many years, and I didn't know that's what I needed to hear. And now I love to just say it to myself. Like, it's all going to be okay, Heidi. It's all going to be okay. And it just, it's like, it puts it in perspective, you know? The perspective isn't up here where I'm in abandonment of my whole self and I'm just up here in the thoughts. Identify your feelings behind the desire and care for them. Um, so again, the self-parenting piece of, you know, soothing, reassuring, comforting, validating. When I catch myself obsessing, I'm not going to wag my finger at me and go, there you are obsessing again, you know, like, well, you know better than that, you know, it's, and, you know, oh, I know I'm so bad. You know, like, the last thing I want to do is shame me. I want, to, I want to care for me. Like, I understand that obsession comes from a place of managing my feelings. And, you know, what do I need to care about instead? And just switch gears. Love me no matter what. And, and move into caring about what's going on and what's coming up. There's something that's coming up. And everything that comes up, requires my time and attention and I'm worthy of my time and attention. No one else is going to do that except me. Um, say the serenity prayer and put the object of your obsession and the obsession in your God box. Um, uh, that is super important to just um, 
I think it was one of our spe one of our speakers today that that shared about uh, feeling anxiety and um, that panic attack and how to get like that reset. You know, like I just need a reset and and um, and so the serenity prayer is kind of like my reset button. Like, okay, wait, wait, wait. You know, get out of here. You get here. Okay, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I mean, there it is. There's obsession recovery right in three sentences, you know? And, um, and it's a reset. And it's a reset that gets stronger and stronger every time that I use it in those moments of powerlessness. Um, surround yourself with reminders, sticky notes, phone banner, affirmations. Um, set an alarm on your phone to pray. If you truly want to break obsession, you will go to any lengths, just like any addiction. Um, so uh, surrender is a powerful affirmation. Here's an affirmation on my wall. Surrender. Surrender more. Because <laughs> surrendering isn't enough. You have to surrender and then surrender and then surrender. So. Um, so yeah, so I do. I surround myself with those things that remind me. Um, like my passwords will often be spiritual principles. So every time I have to, you know, like unlock my phone or get into my computer or, uh, you know, anything like that, I'm logging in all the time and using spiritual principles to remind me to like, oh yeah, get grounded, get connected with God um, and get that perspective back in my moment. Um, redirecting, uh, fill your mind with other thoughts to break the obsessive thinking. So think about work, unless these are the things you're obsessing about, okay. Um, work, talking to friends, do activities with others, watching TV, reading, audio CDs, um, so like speaker tapes and stuff like that, you know, hobbies, sports. Um, and then, you know, even if a choice is not the best self-care, you can get better balance later after you've arrested the obsession. Um, so don't take everything on at once. You don't have to quit all your, you know, all your stuff at the same time. Um, if you get out of balance with something um, in order to fix one addiction, you can get back in better balance with that later. But, but you know, sometimes it just takes what it takes and kind of be gentle with yourself. Um, so maybe to arrest obsession, um, and, and you're, and you're in that place of like not thinking about something. And so, and so you have this desire to medicate more with sleeping, or you have this desire to medicate more with staying busy with your friends. So be it. It's okay if it gets a little out of balance, um, if it arrests the obsession and you can find balance in the other area over some time. Um, we don't have to be perfect. So give yourself a break. And just walk through it. That's our vulnerability as humans. Addiction is powerful. And it, it, you know, it's easy to talk yourself out of, well, I don't want to arrest my obsession and then end up eating ice cream all day, you know. Um, but you know what? Eat ice cream, okay? You know, if that's what it takes to arrest obsession, so be it. Um, so practice being instead of thinking uh, with. Uh, meditation, focused breathing, and mantras like all is well. And I like to think of that as like getting out of my head and in my body. You know, things that move my body, take a walk, um, breathe, you know, deep breathing, um, move your consciousness down into your solar plexus or in your heart region. Connect with parts of you besides your head. You know, um, your head is just your thinking, but your but your heart has a consciousness of its own and your gut has a consciousness of its own and it has all of that wisdom to share with you and if we've been in obsession for a long time we miss out on so much of those messages and so much of that sense of well-being um, that that come from those other centers of us so um, give that a shot directing your thoughts to focus on joyful self-care like vacations, hobbies, loving people, fun projects. Uh, you know, it was, it was hard to admit to myself that, like, I think about 
uh, the shitty things in life way more than I think about the happy things in life. You know, I make up lists in my head of what can go wrong. I don't make up the lists of what can go right and what is going right and what has gone right. You know, like, um, like was shared by somebody here today, I'm addicted to feeling like crap, you know, and I'm addicted to going, you know, going over it and going over it and going over it. What can go wrong? What has gone wrong? Why am I a victim? Why is life a mess? Why am I broken? Instead of going, okay, think about some beautiful things about yourself. And like in the beginning, when I started doing that, uh, which I made a conscious choice to do that during my commute. And so it was then like my, my job, you know, while I was commuting to a rest obsession um, became to think about what I want to bring into my life in the future. And like, you know, like, what do I want to bring more of into my life? Like, I love the outdoors, or I want to go camping, or, you know, that kind of stuff. And it was a hard conversation to get started. You know, it was a hard conversation to get started. If I couldn't get high on it, I really didn't want to engage in the conversation, you know? And uh, it was like, uh, awkward, you know? And, uh, you know, just realizing how powerless I was and that that, that medicative one up, one down, catastrophizing intensity, you know, like I, would, I wouldn't have any problem thinking about the future if I was making up some big fantasy goal that was going to fix everything. But, um, but thinking about things right-sized and healthy and in wholeness and in balance um, and not pretending I know everything about it or that it's, you know, not being able to just put the spin on it that made it all, made my life have meaning now or something, you know, without getting high on it, I didn't know how to think, you know, and um, I didn't know how to think positively, you know. So, um, so pay attention to that and just recognize that it's going to take some time to treat, to train your brain to create the chemicals of well-being, just like any withdrawal, for your brain to create the chemicals of well-being, endorphins, serotonin, and dopamine, and all those things to get back into balance, you're going to have to go through withdrawal. Like, that's what has to happen. doesn't matter what the addiction is. Um, um, and just, you know, stick with it, be gentle, be loving, and, um, and heal your brain's chemistry. Be accountable by consulting with your sponsor about arresting this aspect of your codependence and set up a recovery plan with daily calls on your progress. If you're ready to take it on, make that commitment to, to having somebody lovingly hold you accountable. You know, do your 10th step on it every day. How did, you know, at the end of the day, how did I do with obsession? You know, I caught myself and I was able to arrest it or surrender it to my higher power. I stayed busy by doing this and this and this. Um, you know, I directed myself back to caring about my feelings. And then at the end of the day, you know, like that honest assessment of, you know, I, I'm, I'm paying attention to this. Even if I didn't do it well, or even if I didn't do it perfect, I still am working at this and I'm surrendering and I'm trusting God and I'm taking care of myself as best as I can while I'm learning to let go of something that was so, you know, so deeply ingrained, you know, in me for so many years. And now I'm, I'm you know, be compassionate. I'm trying to build a whole different way to think, you know. Um, and it's, it's okay that it's going to take some time. Acknowledge your progress. Acknowledge your, um, your process and your willingness and surrender it to God. Um, pray for the obsession to be lifted every morning and journal nightly with your inner child or God. Um, you know, make it an important priority in your day. And uh, I will, of course, forget about it and because my brain is trained to think about my to-do list and it's trained to think about lots of other crazy stuff. So that's why I need the reminders around, you know. Um, you know, I have gone to the lengths of putting an affirmation on my ceiling right above my head when I wake up in the morning so that first thing that greets me in the morning is recovery. And so I would welcome you all to do that. And that is a, it's a powerful um, step of self-love and humility to say that if I just let my head do whatever it does by default, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not putting my hands in the best care. Remind yourself that your higher power has your highest good in mind but your brain just has data. You know, my, my head is just 
is just a computer, it's just a dictionary, it's just an encyclopedia. It doesn't really care about me. Like my heart cares about me. If my head isn't checking in with my heart, you know, its idea of care is what's the right thing to do, what will fix all this, what will keep me out of trouble. I mean, you know, it's just evaluating, evaluating, evaluating. It doesn't have care and I'm, I need care. I, I need to be cared about. So my heart and my head have to be consulting with each other, um, you know, in order to get the whole picture of what takes care of me and my higher power, you know, um, my higher power as well. So again, my heart and my spirit need to be involved. Identify patterns of obsession. Um, who, what, where, how, when, so you know what to surrender and where you're vulnerable. Um, so again, it's like uh, once I recognize that there's an obsession on a certain topic or a certain person that I keep cycling back to and pick up again, then I'm going to have to put set higher boundaries for that topic and say, okay, I, I just, I can't go into that story anymore. Like that's off limits. That's, it's in one of those doors on the right in that hallway. And I just put police tape over the door. Like, okay, get out of there. There's no, you know, I need, I need a padlock. <laughs> I need to, you know, brick wall it off or something, you know, and, um, and then ask myself, why am I going in there? What am I seeking in there? What am I looking for? And, you know, what needs my care and time and attention? Because that's what I need to pay attention to. Um, but that's a different door. And so I have to find that. Um, so once we turn it over, meaning obsession, the feelings underneath that are driving the addiction are revealed. And this means it's time for deeper recovery and healing, another layer of the onion. So that's where that self-parenting comes in where we love ourselves no matter what where we you know work at acknowledging accepting the vulnerable feelings of shame that we have the deeper you know it's it's that um the deeper layer of the onion you know and peeling that onion and we never have to peel it if we stay up in our heads we never have to peel it you know and get down to what's in the middle you know, as long as we're making up stories and medicating feelings and avoiding all that. And it's like the onion and we just keep on packing another layer on top of the onion. You know? <laughs> I don't want to get down to the middle of that thing, you know. Um, but what's under there is truly amazing. It's our self, like our abandoned little girl and all our hopes and dreams and and our deepest, most precious, you know, sense of the world. And, and um, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to do that or disappointed about getting there. We need to, we need to get in there and do that work and reclaim that part of our, our wholeness. So um, to respect our time boundary, I'm going to skip the next section, um, which is, uh, self-parenting the true gift but I would you know um, welcome you to read that on your own and and um, share it with your peeps because um, you know self-parenting is how we make this journey a lot more uh, comfortable and nurturing for ourselves recovery isn't something that we just learn to act right it's something we have to, you know, care ourselves into um, change, you know, and nurture the change within ourselves. Um, I can, you know, I can robotically act right all day long and it's not going to fill that hole inside, you know. So the next part is about um, healthy thinking. And this, and this circles back to uh, Heather's question. Um, which is excellent, which is like, okay, so what do we do instead? <laughs> like we've talked about the disease, let's talk about recovery. And um, this, is, this is something that came to me um, that I feel like was inspired by my higher power. 
And um, this will give you a window into my obsessive thinking because I made an acronym for healthy thinking from the word thinking, okay? So, you know, I, I deserve to be the speaker on this topic, okay? Um, so anyway, but it was inspired from my heart and my gut. And, uh, you know, today I can use my, my brain for its right-sized function and it doesn't have to be the be-all and all of everything. Um, but this was really helpful to me and, um, and helps me have some boundaries around thinking and to know when I'm out of those boundaries, okay? So we're gonna go through this and what I want everyone to do is do this with me. And um, I'm gonna ask for some brave people to share their experience of it when we get to the other side. So we're gonna do it ourselves and, and do it privately. Um, but then I would like some people to step up and, um, and if they're comfortable to share what it was like for you. Um, so everybody just think about something that, uh, that you wanna practice some healthy thinking on something in your life right now, an event, situation, or person who, that, that requires your care, that requires your attention, and something that maybe draws you into obsession sometimes. And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna tackle it right now for the next 15 minutes and get a feel for what right-sized thinking, healthy thinking, God-centered thinking can look like. Um, that will, you know, your recovery is yours. You're, it's going to be your job to figure, define your boundaries and, and find a method that works for you. Um, this is just some of my thoughts and experience around it um, that, I've, that I've learned, that I've picked up from others, and that I've, and that I've um, explored. So, um, but you'll need to find what works for you. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is T is for time boundary. So we're going to create a sobriety boundary for thinking about this topic. And, um, you know, a time boundary for me is usually going to be 5 to 15 minutes um, when I'm consciously choosing to think about something. Um, what, what I want to be conscious about when I'm doing that is, is that I have enough time to think about it and then I'm not just using this little window of time to just like get that little hit. Like I want to be conscious when I'm thinking about something that I need to make a decision around or I need to process my feelings with or, um, or need some of my care or attention. Um, I want to be present with it. I don't want to just slip it in in between this little tiny window and not really be conscious with it. And, you know, how, how do you feel when you're trying to share somebody and somebody's kind of like, they're in the middle of a phone call and cooking dinner and they're kind of hearing you out of the side of their, you know, peripheral and you feel dismissed and you feel unimportant and you feel uh, diminished, you know, and the importance of this topic feels diminished. And how often do we do that to ourselves? So with the time boundary, you know, make that time to feel important to you, that this deserves your care and time and attention that we're always out there trying to get from other people. You know, all, the, all the, the, those guys that just ignore us or that don't care about us or that don't take the time for us or that, you know, avoid us or whatever. It's our job to make us feel cared about and um, important and that we're, that we're precious and that we're valuable and that our feelings and thoughts and needs are important and precious and valuable. And this is, you know, this is how I do that is I take that time and I allocate that to me. And as a busy addict and a workaholic, that's really more important for me to do because it's so easy for me to say, it's more important to go throw a little laundry in, you know, or it's more important for me to get on the phone with someone else, you know, that needs my care and time and attention or whatever and support. Um, but, you know, where's my time where I am the most important thing in that 10 or 15 minute window? Where I can feel my feelings, make it safe for me, really tune into what's going on. So um, I, I like to use a five to 15 minute time boundary around that. Of course, that's going to be relative to whatever it is that, you know, you're thinking about. Um, and um, so age is for higher power. So before I get too deep into this process, right out of the gate, I want to pray for my higher power's will and support and care. 
So I wanna invite you all to take a moment in whatever fashion that is for you, um, whatever higher power that you have in your life, and just, um, and just set that intention for yourself. Okay, thank you. So I is for inner child. Um, so now this is the step where I check in with my inner child um, and make sure that I'm in my parent, first of all. If I check in with my little kid, I, I, it automatically puts me out of my little kid so that if I was in my little kid, now I've got some better perspective, you know? Um, it's about being conscious in my, in my thinking process and not just letting my little kid go crazy. You know, my little kid is the one that looks for um, fixes in her head, and my adult has built some higher responsibility for my thoughts having integrity, my thoughts being the truth, um, my thoughts, um, you know, like owning my part, owning my wants and needs, um, owning, that I don't know everything, that the answers aren't all in my head. Um, and, um, and so I've gotta make sure that I'm in my adult to access those skills, those adult thinking skills. Um, so take a minute and check in with your little kid. And um, part of that process might be to say, why don't you go play? Um, I'm gonna think about this decision that I need to make. And I know that it might be important to you also, and I'll let you know what we decide, and then we can talk about it. But I'm gonna make this decision. So, so how about, you know, go play, um, and, and then I'll come and get you when I'm done. Okay, so um, N is for neutral. And this is where I'm sort of checking the temperature of my, um, I guess it's a shame temperature is what I'm really taking. Like um, I wanna make sure that I'm in, oh, that I'm open-minded, that I'm approaching my, my topic of thinking without uh, a targeted outcome. So, which would be like, I want to villainize, which means that I want to arrive at a certain destination. I want my, you know, because that's what happens in most of my obsessive thinking is that I'm trying to arrive at, um, you were wrong, I was right. I want to arrive at feeling better. I want to arrive at a one up. I want to arrive at, I have all the answers. I want to arrive at, um, at um, it's not my fault, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so if, if I truly am in healthy thinking, it means I care about me, I'm right-sized, I trust where the truth is gonna lead me, that my heart is open, that my mind is open, um, and that I'm exploring this honestly with some integrity, and I don't have an attachment to a targeted outcome, you know, an expectation, if you will. Um, that I'm going to have all the answers and figure it out, um, or that I'm going to go on this ghost hunt uh, or witch hunt um, and figure out all the shit I did wrong, you know? Because um, either one of those is a targeted outcome. And instead, I'm going to have some healthy, um, sane, and um, caring thoughts about the situation or the person or the event. So I got to check that out and make sure that I'm in that neutral space. Um, and again, like looking for charge, looking for it in my body, checking my motives, um, looking for intensity, 
Um, and if I discover that there is, it might not be the time to think about it. What might be the time is to just care about my feelings and then deflate some of the intensity of those feelings and come back to the thinking part later when I make a decision or I'm evaluating what to do next um, or where I stand on a certain situation. Um, so that neutral part is like, if I'm not neutral, then that means there's some intensity. It probably means I have some emotions that need to be taken care of before I can do this healthy thinking process. So K is for kindness. So as I engage in the thinking that I wanna move through my thoughts with, with, um, with compassion and caring. Um, so, you know, be kind with myself when I discover things I've done wrong. You know, be kind with myself when I discover the desire to one-up somebody or when I feel myself, um, you know, exploring a thought that puts blame on someone else, you know, um, and just, and just continue to bring kindness into that, um, that, that this is a safe place for me to be. I have to have a safe place to think, you know, that it has to be safe for me to go and explore things honestly. The only way for that to happen is to love myself and others unconditionally, to just have this it, you know, boundary that says that I approach this with kindness because anything less is going to land in doing harm to myself or others. You know, if I'm looking for fault, if I'm looking for points, if I'm looking for, you know, to build a case or I've got to just approach this with kindness so that thinking becomes a safe practice for me, um, that my head is, that my, that my whole self, but certainly my head is is a wonderful place to live. I am pretty much stuck here the rest of my life. So I might as well make it a really nice place I wanna be. And that would be kindness. Um, so I is for inventory. So here's where I take out the facts. I'm searching, a searching and fearless exploring of the situation, the feelings and the opportunities around this situation, whatever it is going on. Um, that now's, now's where you stay in your neutral space, stay connected to your higher power and inner child, and practice kindness, and, and explore your, the situation, your feelings, and the opportunities around it. And I'm going to allow everybody five minutes, and we're going to just be quiet, and everybody can take that five minutes to do your inventory on whatever your subject was that you wanted to practice healthy thinking on. So it is 3.32, so I'm going to keep going at 3.37. So enjoy, enjoy your thinking. Make it safe. It's your home. Decorate it how you want it to look. Now shut up.
I'm Heidi and I'm codependent. Can you guys hear me again? Yes. I can't hear any of you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, So now, so the the next N is for the next right thing. So now that you've taken some time um, to explore your thoughts, feelings, and the situation, um, given what you know now, what's the next right action or decision? And so that's where I do myself the gift of a conclusion, um, you know, part of me making my world a safe world to think in is that I don't leave conversations just ongoing forever. And you know, that, that, you know, that wherever I went in that, in that process of thinking, whether it brought up powerlessness for me or fear or concern or, um, or there's something there to acknowledge um, that, that, I, that I wrap that up in my self-parenting and assure myself that I'm okay, that I'm that here's my next step, that I'm gonna walk forward with my higher power, um, and that I've had some conclusion. Even if the conclusion is, okay, this is bigger than I thought, you know, I have more feelings around it or more concerns, or I need to talk with some people, you know, even if I didn't come to like, oh, here it is, here's the gem, and here's the perfect answer, and here's how it's all gonna play out now, and I feel perfect and I feel safe. And, all my life is just, you know, it's, it's all, you know, fixed. And uh, so that's not where I needed to get. Where I needed to get was, okay, I gave this some time and attention. I'm safe. Um, I know what I need to do next. Even if what I need to do next is uh, write about it some more, talk to God about it some more, let some time pass, feel my feelings. Um, um, or if I'm ready to confront someone or set a boundary, um, that I know that that's the next right thing I need to do. And, um, and so I can feel, um, you know, safe in my healthy process of things. And, um, and I tell myself that I'm safe. I'm safe when I say I'm safe. I say I'm safe when I decide that I'm safe. Um, So then, so then the G is God, and then pray for the power to carry it out. So here's where I take all that stuff that I've done, and now I put it in God's hands, and I'm like, okay, I need you for this. I need you to help me stay right-sized while I confront this person, or set this boundary, or step back from this relationship, or ask for a raise at work, or, you know, I don't want to, you know, you know, Thinking, positive, uh, powerful thinking can be around simple things too, especially things that I've often medicated around, like what do I want to do with my Saturday afternoon, you know? Am I going to, you know, get obsessive with my house and clean my baseboards and do all my laundry and, you know, have this fantasy out there that I'm going to feel better when everything's perfect around me? Or am I going to get into some healthy you know, balance with that and say, I'm going to do some housework and I'm also going to do some reading and I'm going to make a phone call and connect with one of my friends and I'm going to have some downtime and watch a little TV. And, you know, I feel like making myself a really nice salad, you know, or brownies. <laughs> but, um, you know, getting to that place where I invite God into that process to help me do it with being conscious, being in my recovery, and not playing out some expectation of the story that I just created. Because if that's what I do next, is I just go into the, you know, I just go into the playing, playing this out with this, with the story of it's all going to fix everything and make me all better and life will be perfect, then I'm, um, I'm not present and I'm probably going to end up in some self-will again and shame spiraling. So, um, so it's important when I get when I get through the process and I'm done thinking to give myself permission to be done thinking so I can put it down and validate that I did a good job with that in taking care of myself. Um, so I would really invite somebody else to, um, to share what their experience was with this process if anybody feels uh, compelled to do so. Yes, Heidi, um, Aman would like to say something. 
Hold on, I'm unmuting. There you go. Hi, I'm a Madam Codependent. So I wrote for time uh, when it comes to obsessing about the welfare or like well being about people who are close to me. Um, so time, I think 15 minutes is an appropriate time for me to uh, make a decision about the course of action and to process my feelings because these are people who care about me. Um, for H, higher power, I will ask my, my higher power, I call God, um, to, I'll pray that God looks after um, this child of God and I pray that I can have trust in that only God has the power to heal this person I love. Um, in terms of I, uh, I'll check in with my inner child and say, you know, it's okay, you have God, you have people that you can talk to um, about the fear that you're feeling, and it's okay to feel scared. And what you said about go, you can go and play and I'll take care of this because I'm the grown up. Um, when it comes to N, uh, neutral, I'll check to see, you know, the outcome is for me to feel that I love this person and that I care. And um, if I feel like I am compelled to uh, make suggestions, you know, about what would I do in that situation, I'll check out and, and come back later to this. With K, kindness, um, I'll learn that, you know, interventions was a way of me uh, distracting myself from the fear I was feeling. So, you know, coming up with suggestions, trying to fix things. And um, I'll acknowledge that fear in my inner child and that I deserve to feel courageous in trying, you know, to find a new way of like handing it over. With I um, inventory, I'll check to see, you know, um, ask for permission, do they want to just be listened to, do they want feedback, um, you know, do I feel like I'm going to, you know, kind of want to cross that boundary of uh, making suggestions and with N, the next right thing, um, you know, I will pray to my higher power, um, if it's for them to decide, I'll, um, if there's any like kind of pushback, I'll, I'll, I'll still hand it over, you know, to my higher power and I'll pray, I'll listen and, um, and I'll always make sure I ask for permission. And then for G, for God, I will, you know, pray for my higher power to, to handle this because only, only they can. Mm -hmm. And that's Beautiful. Where yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Love it. Anyone else want to share? I don't see anyone, Heidi. At the moment. Oh, we do have one more person. Okay, hold on. Let me un let me unmute you. From San Diego, you are unmuted. Okay, give me give me real quick a couple minutes. Let me close the door because I'm at work. Okay. And first, of all, <laughs> first of all, it was amazing hearing you guys while I'm at work, and now I know why my friend tells me uh, that I'm codependent sometimes, which it gets me off guard. Huh? And uh, and it it's funny how I heard you guys say uh, mental self assault um, because um, I'm on probation and even my probation officer said uh, I don't you don't need me because you beat yourself up enough so you're doing a pretty good job you know what I mean you don't need me to keep you in check because you do a pretty good job trying to keep yourself on check and um and the part of reverse and neutral and drive i like i like that part because it reminds me of the advice that my mother gives me she when she sees me down and out she usually tells me like mija you're like a motorcycle you don't have no reverse you, you just gonna have to keep on going forward you know what i mean and um so with that being said um um 
with that being said, I, I, this is new to me, and I'm grateful that I came and listened to you guys. I've been listening to you guys since I was working, and you guys have a lot of information that I could utilize and be a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you found us. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you very much. You're muted. I just, I just realized I muted myself. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. I think I muted myself. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. All right. Yes, it's me again. <laughs> so I'm relating to all of this. Hi. Um, so, yes, this was great, Heidi. I've never seen a thing where you like, put limits on your thinking, which is really cool because it's something that I'm definitely going to incorporate into my recovery program. Um, so yeah, putting a boundary of the time, my situation, of course, that I'm considering is, well, I shouldn't say of course, not everybody knows, but is my relationship with my daughter who's 21 and she's a college student and <clears throat> we have a very um, codependent and not healthy relationship with a lot of manipulation and button pushing and right now it's happening really bad today um, as a matter of fact i was barraged with text messages during our break um so i blocked her and i'm dealing with that after this after i talked to my sponsor so i did this little thinking exercise on that and it was great because you know, I identified that my inner child was the one that had all the feelings that were like buttons being pushed, but that the parent could, you know, kind of take over and be more logical about it and come up with a plan. Um, of course, turning it over to my higher power first. Um, and then, um, you know, trying to stay open-minded um, is really important because since I do have all those buttons and we both have them, we have this codependent manipulative relationship for all these years um, it's it's very easy for me to not stay open-minded and to not even realize it so thinking about that was really helpful um, to come at it from a place of kindness which is like humility kind of goes along with that open-mindedness but also to think of her as a person that I love and care about you know and not the enemy <laughs> is really helpful um, and so, and then on the inventory part, you know, I just kind of spent some time meditating on, you know, the, all of what I just said and that what should come from the situation is that, you know, I had gone into all these different details of things that I was going to say. And then I, and then I came to that I need to make it clear and concise and that's what's going to work best. I don't need to add all these extra details, but that I need to talk to my sponsor about it first. So after we're done this, I already have an appointment with my sponsor to talk about this. Um, so that's the next right thing. That's what I'm going to do is the next right action <clears throat> as far as in this, um, this one thought process. Um, and then after I talk to her, I'll know what the action needs to be. And then, of course, it's just praying for the power to carry that out, which is probably the hardest part because of those buttons and manipulation that get in the way. So anyway thank you again for this tool i'm going to definitely incorporate it thanks michelle it's great that was great thanks for sharing it anybody else linda nope okay um Next slide. So, um, so at each step, stop moving forward if the integrity of healthy thinking is lost. Um, so for instance, if you start with T time boundary and you realize you don't have time to set aside for a healthy thinking process, then hold off until later. So you don't just spin your wheels, scare yourself, or use it to fix. Um, and, and that's that, you know, that checking your motives tool. Um, or if you check in with your inner child and there's big feelings there, that may be a sign that those need your attention more than thinking. So you can choose to care and comfort 
for now and not try to figure it out. Or if you get to the next right thing and you're not clear and ready to make a decision or plan of action, then the next right thing may be to set it aside, let it, let it unfold in God's time and come back to it later, but not to keep forcing it until you come to an answer so you feel in control or get it over with. And that, you know, that kind of goes hand in hand with, um, with Heather's question earlier about like that second step. What does sanity look like in thinking? You know, sanity would be that I don't come at it from a place of I have to know the answer right now or that there's some perfect answer out there that I have to chase, you know, but rather that thinking is just this tool and it's part of my decision making process and that, you know, but my life is in God's hands. My thinking is in God's hands. I'm not taking it back all the time, going off on all these little stories to try to medicate. Um, but, uh, but I stay aligned with my higher powers will for me. And that's where I have safe thinking. And um, so um, at any point, if you get triggered into shame, one up or one down, or panic, uh, change the focus to caring about you and your feelings instead of the life situation. Um, you and your loving care are always the pathway to the right decisions about your life. Um, caring about the shame, the panic, the fear in this moment is always more important than finding the right answer out there somewhere. And that's a hard one to give up because I'm always, you know, my, for many, many years, you know, the, the, the thought was that, that my well-being is when I get to the right answer. When I figure it out, then I'm going to feel better. Um, but it doesn't work. So if it did, I would still be doing it. <laughs> For sure. So uh, that is the end of the presentation. And um, since we have a couple of minutes, I wanted to open it up if anybody has any, like to do a little Q&A maybe. You can just chat or you can raise your hand. Um, I will send the handout to everyone who doesn't already have it that messaged me in the chat box. Um, it's exactly like the slides, so you'll have them to read over and, you know, redo, you know, whenever you need to work on something that you're obsessing about. Um, I'm just reading the questions. Can Heidi inform the group of the places in CODA? I'm not sure I understand that. You can go to www.coda.org and I'll type that into the chat box. There's all kinds of information there. Um, the handouts are there. Um, you can also go to our Facebook page, which is um, facebook.com, Coda Arizona. And Deepak has a question. I will unmute you. Hang on and you can ask away. Go ahead, Chuck. Um, Here we go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heidi, for um, this workshop and you took a lot from it. Um, things that I never even thought about. Um, so very grateful for that. I have a question. Um, in your slide, slide four, recovery tools to arrest obsession. The very first point is written. We must first have boundaries about how, when, where, and what and why we think in order to know whether we are just thinking or obsessing whether it's healthy or addictive thinking so my question is all around the boundaries around obsession you know currently i'm 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 obsessing about well i don't I, i'm not even sure if obsession is the right word but i'm grieving the relationship with my siblings and my mother in terms of not ever having that fulfilling relationship with them and yeah okay as, as well as as I'm grieving it there's, there's there is some obsession of as I grew up in my dysfunctional family um, the definition of what a sister should be what a mother should be no longer served me um, and they were not the definitions that you know my siblings or my parents lived up to um how can i 
set a boundary around that because there's a lot of hurt there there's a lot of pain there's a lot of anger there's a lot of denial um is setting a boundary not kind of okay i understand i can't wallow and sit on the people hands up but isn't there a process that needs to be followed because otherwise you know am i not owning my feelings in order to get there by going through that process does that make sense yeah i hear what you're saying like like uh you know it's that fear of you know if i let if i open the pandora's box of of you know this lifetime of pain around this thing that it's gonna just now i'm gonna just sit and wallow in it for years and years um and um and uh you know where's where's the healthy grieving and where's the healthy acknowledgement of what i didn't get um what was what was there what was offered instead how i coped with that how i survived that what i wish would have happened um and and how do i have healthy thoughts you know and boundaries around that um so that i'm not medicating and when can you tell when is it when is it medicating and when is it like true grief and true true acknowledgement of loss and true anger around what you didn't get um is that does that sound right you're muted i can't hear you can we unmute deepak you're muted too linda <laughs> yeah hi i'm back sorry i was, I was muted. okay <laughs> well, well spotted well spotted thank you i was muted um, okay yeah absolutely spot on because you know in 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 that in that subsequent slide where you speak about creating a, like healthy thinking creating a sobriety boundary like when i'm triggered there's no way i can sit there and say right 15 minutes and that's up i'm in pain i'm on the floor i'm in yeah. like despair so i'm yeah. just trying to put this into practical terms i'm not saying what you're saying is impossible no i'm not saying that i'm trying yeah. to i'm trying to take the the, the the nectar of what you're sharing with me with the wider community here tonight how can yeah. i express that but yeah your your initial um mirroring back my question was spot on yeah right right well you know when feelings are really really big those are just feelings and then you know the and those and those are for me you know i have trauma i've done a lot of trauma recovery i've you know been curled up on a ball in a ball many times you know um and um and those are feelings that need to be validated and released and um and there's you know a, a way to do it you know what what i have found to be more useful is to come from a place of care um instead of like helplessness or hopelessness or self-pity or um i guess um you know it's it's like i can i can almost do you know compound the damage or do more damage if i if i get to those deep core wounds and and then i don't have a self-parent on board to say honey that was horrible what you went through i'm so sorry that you went through that and hold me while i saw but instead i'm this abandoned person that has you know found all these feelings and now i'm laying on the floor feeling hopeless and alone you know um and i've done both you know it's way more productive if i have a healthy parent on board but i don't get a healthy parent until i build those skills you know and um and that takes time you know to to build those skills um i think what is important is you know acknowledging our trauma reaching out for other people to support us and hold us until we have a healthy parent on board um and 
until we build that resilience within ourselves to let those feelings pour out and hold them in high regard, hold them in safety, hold them as precious, instead of just be regressed into our child uh, where, you know, where it's all overwhelming and we're just a train wreck and nobody cares and all of that, you know, so those are the thoughts that come with that, that come to me right now is that when I think back to um, that kind of, um, you know, earlier hitting bottom with my, um, with my pain and first discovering trauma um, is that, is that the only thoughts that came with that pain were, you know, fearful, scary, I'm not enough, that I'll never figure this out, you know, stuff like that. I had to learn from other people that I was going to be okay. And that's why we have sponsorship. That's why we go to meetings and hear those messages from others. You know, that's why we're taught to um, call somebody when we're heading down that dark road, you know, um, and, and we start to build by example, the role modeling of other people, um, watching how they take care of their little kid, watching how they step into their adult, watching how they gracefully can accept their, their, their shame, gracefully can accept their life lessons, gracefully can, or ungracefully can, can find some humility, you know, call themselves out on their stuff, you know, um, we don't, it's not in there somewhere, <laughs> you know, we have to have it role modeled for us in order to learn what's healthy and then say, I like that. I like how that looks. That, that resonates with me. That feels appropriate. That, that person has something that I want and spend time with them and have conversations with them and explore things on an intimate level in order for those skills to get transferred from one person to another. You know, I've, I did therapy for years that absolutely helped. I've been on the phone with people over and over and over, walking through my stuff. Um, you know, reading the stories in the CODA literature is really helpful um, because, you know, it talks about, uh, you know, the, the disease, the bottom, the, the fear, the, the trauma, you know, and then it also talks about how I learned how to think differently, you know, how I learned how to have boundaries how I have boundaries with those thoughts. You know, first you have the crazy thought, then you have the boundary thought. And that's just how we start, we learn how to, how to bridge that, you know, is that, you know, every time I have a shitty thought about myself, I have this adult on board that says, Heidi, whoa, 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 that's not okay. You know, pull that in. Like, okay, so what is a healthy thought? I hold myself responsible. I feel healthy shame around self-criticism today. I don't go into a shame spiral and I don't get high. I feel healthy shame that like, okay, that wasn't very nice to me. That's out of my integrity. So how could I word that differently that doesn't disempower me, that doesn't villainize me, that doesn't, that doesn't breed hopelessness or, you know, make me feel like I'm just this rug to be walked on or whatever it was that I was, you know, making up. It's like, I'm enough, I'm okay. And I find that right size language that empowers me, but doesn't get me high that makes it safe for me to live right-sized, not one up and not one down, but right-sized. Right-sized is my happy place. That is where I am enough and I'm not better than others and I don't have to achieve or perform to be enough. And um, it's where my higher power is. It's where I'm equal to everyone. Um, it's where others are safe to be themselves and they don't threaten me and I'm not running around comparing myself to everybody. I, I, this is like, this is the bar and I try to stay as close to right sized as I can and, um, and, and own my gifts um, and own my uh, shortcomings um, and love and adore them all in the same way. They all make me human and they're all valuable in their own way. Um, so can we unmute Deepak again, just so that we can see if, I was on the right track with that. Yeah, hi, thanks. Thanks for your response. Um, to be honest, I don't know what to respond to that. Um, how that, about, that, how that, about just take my phone number and we'll have a conversation offline and yeah, um, we can talk. 
I'm in the UK. If you want to WhatsApp it to me, oh, no. if you if you, if you want to send it to me, I'm in London, UK. If you want to message, private message me with it, I can WhatsApp you. But I don't want to just say, yes, it was okay or no, it wasn't. Because to be honest, your response was very profound and I'm processing it and digesting it. And I'll probably yeah. have to hear back the recording and, and fast forward to this part because what you said there is very profound. I, I was in touch with it to a certain part and then I sort of like zoned out. Um, it sounded good, but yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. And if you want, you can, I don't mind. If you don't mind, you can just private message me your number and I can WhatsApp you, but that's your choice. Okay, okay. Afterwards, we'll chat and figure that out. Um, just so everyone knows, Heidi's um, email is on the top of the handout, the PDF that you should have gotten, and it's uh, attached to the, if you scroll up in the chat box, the handout is there as well. Okay, Heidi, we have um, one more person with a question or a share, anonymous. I'm going to okay. unmute you. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. I have one for Heidi, and then I also have one for Deepak. And the question I have for Deepak is, how much code of recovery do you have? And then the question for Heidi is, how does the program of Codependence Anonymous fit in with all this? Thanks. Pass. Well, I'll go first. Um, thanks for your question. Um, I would say that um, that obsession is uh, kind of how I started my workshop was by talking about the patterns and characteristics of Codependence Anonymous. Um, when we're acting out in avoidance, uh, when we're acting out in control patterns, um, you know, when we're in people pleasing, when we're whatever, we have to make a story up about it first in our head. And, um, and that, you know, if you take obsession out of the equation, just the vehicle of obsession itself, that all of our defects of character very often lose their power because they can only have, um, you know, as, as much energy as we give them. And the energy that we give them is in thinking about them very often. I mean, sometimes it's behaviors, but most of the time, even behaviors are preceded by thinking. So if we can arrest the obsession where we take off in our head and go build a story to validate or villainize or justify or, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, the stories that we make up about how, we, how, we're, how we're not enough or how we're over enough, how we do too much, you know, all those stories are about medicating feelings. And, um, and ultimately are blocking ourselves from really tuning in inward and taking care of those feelings that need our care. We're just going to try to think them away or fix them in our thinking. So that would be my answer. And now you're up, Deepak. Thank you, Heidi. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So I've been in 12 Step for the last four years, just over four years. I worked the 12 steps in a similar 12, um, in a similar relationship, um, 12 step fellowship. Um, I've been in CODA for just over two years. I'm on step one and I'm looking for a sponsor. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Deepak. Okay, I think it's time for us to wrap it up. And, um, and I think that uh, at the beginning of the uh, event, we had talked about um, people being able to stay on a little bit longer if they wanted to use this space for some connections, for some support, or to look for a sponsor. So if anybody's interested in um, or looking for a sponsor, then we're going to leave the room open so people can connect on the chat for that. Okay. Uh, afterwards, so, so just go ahead and stay on. And um, am, I, am I following the format right, Linda? Yep. Okay. So how about we um, maybe do the serenity prayer and then Paul can play a little guitar and anybody who wants a sponsor can get on chat and anybody who, want, who can sponsor.
can be on chat and maybe we can make some connections. Does that sound good? Yes. Okay. Um, Heidi, do you want to lead us in the serenity prayer? I'll let everybody, we could say it together. Okay. Hi, everybody. Shout out. Yay. Hey. Thank, you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Heidi, just, just FYI, one of the uh, participants who had to drop off put in the chat box that she was in tears because she feels like she's home. So I just want to let you know that you've had a, a very positive impact on everyone today and, and tons of positive feedback in the chat box. So thank you so much for sharing. Your, your experience. Thanks, Linda. I got a lot out of it. Yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of good reminders, so I'm really happy about that. that works, huh? <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Um, let's have a moment of um, kind of quietness. Probably not silence, but maybe quietness, and um, and then we'll close the meeting with the uh, with the serenity prayer. <laughs> Side. Serenity. 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 Courage to change the things I can. I can. Oh, the wisdom to know, to know the difference. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.